The 1-0 to Doty. Big swing! Could it be? Will it be? It is! Walk it off, Kane Doty! Tigers win! The 1-0 to Doty. Big swing! at home plate as LSU takes the series with the walk-off two-run homer off the bat of Kate Doty. 4-3 is the final score. Wrap it up in purple and gold. Tigers with the win move to 29 and 14, 12 and 9 in SEC play. Harness it and throw strikes. Sounded like yesterday inside of the box is Chris Blair with one of his greatest calls of being on the microphone as the voice of LSU. K. Doty walks off Georgia as the Tigers take two of three from the Bulldogs and improve to 29 and 14 overall and 12 and 9 in SEC play. Huge weekend for LSU, enormous weekend for our city. There's a ton to get to. Here on the Jordy Collada Show, we got a jam-packed show. Greg Brooks, transferred defensive back from Arkansas, Louisiana native, is going to be here in the second hour. So will Garrett Nussmeyer. Nussmeyer, a part of that quarterback competition coming out of spring. Both guys going to be in studio with us here during the 8 o'clock hour. So make sure you set your dial and you're tuned in with us. And if you have not already subscribed to our YouTube channel, we'd appreciate it if you could hit that subscription button. Hit the bell. Make sure you're notified for all of the content that's coming out to you here on this Monday morning and all throughout the week. We appreciate you starting your week and your Monday with us as it was a fantastic weekend down here in South Louisiana. There's so much to get to, man. The NFL draft wrapped up. LSU had 10 players drafted. The problem definitely was not talent for LSU football over the past couple of seasons. Who was surprised to look up and see the Tigers have 10 names come off of the board over the weekend? We'll talk about all of that. We'll talk about the New Orleans Saints draft. It looks like Tyron Matthew and the Saints are now kind of on a crash course to strike a deal and maybe bring the Honey Badger back to New Orleans, back home. We'll talk a little bit about that. So much to get to here on this Monday morning. But as we've told you, please make sure and hit that like button, that share button, that comment button here for us on this Monday morning as daily we're driven and powered by Go Chevrolet on the Jordy Collada Show. Remember, you can find them online at G-E-A-U-X Chevrolet.com. Every day our water is provided by True Blue Water, T-R-U, BlueWater.com. If you want to hop on the delivery route, our official spice is Papa Earl's. 30% less sodium than the competition. If you want to cook something up and leave a little bit more salt out of the recipe than usual, then pick up Papa Earl's. Anywhere you shop locally, you can pick it up. And our phone line is Metropolitan Health Group. And as we said, our phone line, nobody on it today, but every day that we are on the phone, it's brought to you by our friends Jason Ramazan and Charlie Harvey over at Metropolitan Health Group. Real doctors, real solutions, as um, it was a fantastic weekend here in South Louisiana. I want to start uh, on Saturday night in Tiger Stadium, if you don't mind. There's a ton of sports to get to, but it was a huge event for uh, for our city this weekend. In fact, uh, Kelly and I had a uh, a really cool weekend, man. It was uh, uh, it was our son Jordan Colada. He had uh, the Our Lady of Mercy had their uh, had their fair this weekend, uh, so it was fairs and festivals all weekend. On Friday night, uh, we went down to Festival International on uh, in Lafayette, and uh, man, ate some really good food, listened to some good music. Um, Kelly's aunt's got a little place in Arnoville, Louisiana, which is my first time ever to experience the town of Arnoville, which is a cool little spot right outside of Lafayette. We, we woke up and ate a, uh, a great breakfast, a buffet style breakfast that you rarely still find. The Where did buffet. y'all go again? Uh, big little, little cup. cup. The yeah, place is fire. In Arnoville. Mm-hmm. Um, little, little hidden, great spot. hidden gem, little a hidden gem. Diamond, dude. 
um, just all of it, the whole thing. Like, I mean, like the, the setting, it's on the bayou. You can sit outside. I mean, it was a beautiful weekend uh, and a beautiful Saturday morning down there. Um, we ate there. We got up. We came back. We went and saw Little Jay at the Our Lady of Mercy Fair, which was fantastic. Sunshiny Saturday. Rested up a little bit. Drove over to the uh, drove over to the to the, the the studio on Saturday. Jumped on our bikes and rode our bikes over to Garth Brooks to skip out on the traffic, and timed it perfectly. I mean, like we pulled up onto campus probably at around ten minutes to eight. Locked our bikes up over by the PMAC, walked into the uh, into Tiger Stadium, and within about three or four minutes, Garth Brooks takes the stage and he was man, calling Baton Rouge. Look, I'm I'm not I am not a country music advocate. Uh, we did go to Nashville a couple of weekends ago, which was great to kind of learn a little bit more about the history of country music and to see the, the popularity. Bar. Yeah, the, the kid <laughs> rock bar, um, but. Garth Brooks in Tiger Stadium with 103,000 people there. The energy that guy had was unreal. I mean, first off, the way that they had it set up, the stage was about on the 20-yard line and probably went into the south end zone, kind of the student section, right? I mean, it, but it was a 360-degree stage which yeah girth 360 Brooks. degrees of girth <laughs> um but i mean it was it, you, you it was fully visible from every every angle you could see all parts of the stage i mean if you had been to bayou country Superfest in the past they had usually cut off a section of the stadium for the stage they had set the stage up on like kind of like the 20 yard line back and they had barked uh kind of like blocked off almost a you know the entire back section of the stadium on saturday they they could take advantage of the field. Jeez, they could take this. advantage of of the entire seating in the stadium, all of the premium seating, all of the nosebleed, and it was um, it was electric, man. And you know, for somebody like it's us, a football game, Lloyd, who's kind of starting to learn a lot about lighting and how important lighting is to a production, his lighting first and foremost is incredible. I mean, the way that. You walked in when you walked into the stadium. I mean, Kelly and I were both like, "Jesus, this is incredible!" I mean, look at this place, man. It's and a this is game. It, this is I believe this is like unanswered prayers when um, everybody pulled their cell phone out and hit the flashlight. But I'm just talking about like his stage lighting that's coming off of of his stage. The way that he lit the crowd up was um, unreal. It was amazing, man. It was amazing. And when he played Call in Baton Rouge and friends in low places it felt like alabama it felt like florida it felt like i mean it was as loud as you've ever heard that place i mean like the the tale goes back to the earthquake game with hodson hit fuller in 88 is when you know he hit him on that fourth down in the geology building there's a seismograph and it showed up on the seismograph which kind of dubbed that game the earthquake game on I believe that was like October 8th of 1988. This sh did the same thing on Saturday night when they played Colin Baton Rouge. They tracked the time. I think like when he hit a certain point of the song. I mean, bro, it was electric in there. I mean, you were just looking around and you couldn't even hear the person next to you. It was like a, it you know was like a football game. It was, it was exactly like a football game. And not only was it like a football game, it was like one of the most electric football games you've ever been to, loudest. I mean, to me, it's the 2007 Florida game, the 2012 God Alabama me, game. It was that electric? It was that loud. It was that electric. Absolutely. It was top three experiences in no. that stadium for me. God no doubt about it. it. Dude, I, for, for, I'm telling you. From a native, from somebody that lives <laughs> so here, funny. I can't believe they don't do this stuff more. I hope that they had their eyes opened on Saturday night. Now, there's probably only a certain amount of entertainers that can put 100-plus thousand people in that stadium and make it look and feel like that. But I would follow the blueprint that you had on Saturday night or maybe bring him back, whatever it may be. You go get a headline act and put them in Tiger Stadium because that experience was resellable. If you can, if you, you can, can find bring the that back, yeah. if you can find, if you can find the entertainer to bring that back, it was, I it mean, was an amazing night. I feel like it's only girth that can do that though, right? Like just because of the set and setting and the song. I don't know if it's just him. 
I think he is. But you don't want one to turn Tiger Stadium select. into a venue. Uh, no, I don't, uh, Lloyd. But I, I would play one concert a year. You know what I mean? Like I would do this once a year, where I could bring one act in, and I could. I mean, dude, I I don't know who who else is out there like this. I mean, that's what I'm saying. The, the I Rolling think, Stones. I mean, maybe I mean, he's done. Mick Jagger's almost dead. He is almost but, dead. So maybe that's not not the, the 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 person. But I mean, I I know what Garth Brooks did. Right? I mean, I'd imagine George Strait could probably... I mean, he was covering well, George Strait's yeah, songs. Yeah, you're just doing Bay Country Superfest uh, all over again. Yeah, but I'm just talking about the one, one act. One act. Just one act. One night. I think it's just him because he has, like we said, calling Baton Rouge, and it hasn't happened in so long. I think yeah. it was just such a visceral experience because he hasn't been around in Baton Rouge in a long time. And we were talking before the show, I thought he came like every year, but I was way wrong, way off on my Garth takes. But apparently, people love him. And for him to hit the calling Baton Rouge, and I, I talked to people that were going like it was a football game. They tailgated the yeah. thing, and they were going for one song and one song only. Yeah. And that is not, I mean, I guess it is shocking that it registered on the seismograph, but people were hammered and ready for some calling Baton Rouge. Put it on the poll, and I mean, like, really, there's, there's nothing to vote on. You tell us, who's the entertainer outside of Garth that could fill Tiger Stadium like that? Poll question brought to you by Southern Eye Center of Baton Rouge, located on Jefferson Highway. If you mention the Jordy Collada show, when you go in there, you get 25% off of your sunglass selection. Uh, but I'm just saying that Saturday night in Tiger Stadium, and I'm not the country music guy. I'm not trying to sell you on country music. I'm not. I was going for the entertainment value. I saw a documentary on Garth Brooks. Kelly and I watched a documentary. It was a two part documentary on Garth Brooks, and we fell in love with the guy. I mean, like he sits with the chair backwards when he talks. I mean, he's a super a. A. intense Slater's it? guy. Yes, <laughs> goes cha- goes hair. He goes chair backwards. Puts his arms on, cries over everything. Anytime he mentions his daughters, anytime he mentions like works. concerts, I mean, it is like legit crying. You know what I mean? Like you fall in love with the guy. I guess. And yeah, right. Just for the you <laughs> yeah. know the, the shock value of him, man. <laughs> Just kind of the entertainment value of him. And I mean, when given that opportunity, I get that people may not like country music. He may not even like Garth Brooks. There's no way you could have left Saturday night and not said, I don't respect the entertainer, right? Like, you may not like his music. You may not like him. But the entertainment that he put on on Saturday night was, it was great. And so, I mean, I watched I watched the, I watched the Red Hot Chili Peppers yesterday at Jazz Fest. I watched some acts on Friday night at Festival International. I mean, I've been and, and, and enjoy going to music entertainment and Garth Brooks is as good of a entertainment dollar that you can spend in my opinion. I mean, the guy, he came out after he finished up what was felt like a, a day long set. He played every single song that I've ever heard Garth Brooks sing and more like he played Bob Seger's night moves. He played Amarillo by morning by George Strait, And then to me, when he got like my ultimate respect, tip of the hat, Garth, you're the man, bro. Like you're the guy. He came out after he wrapped up kind of like his band and he brought his wife out, Trisha Yearwood, which was electric. Uh, he introduced all of his band members, which are super talented people. And then like he sang all of his songs. They all leave the stage. Garth comes back by himself walks around this stage. I mean, he's hamming it up. 300, oh, no doubt he is. No, and, and by the way, 60 years old, and this stage has like got platforms on it. It just pains me to see him jump off of these platforms in cowboy boots running full speed. I mean, it looks like he's, he's going to blow an Achilles, off, bro. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but he's walking around the stadium. Not, I mean, the stage. like in a three, And he's just stopping and talking to people, like right there in the front. And he's kind of responding to signs. You know what I mean? Like people are like, Please like somebody, 18. some ladies like, I mean, some girls like, will you walk me down the aisle in November? And he's kind of like, congratulations. You know what I mean? Take like, me to prom. I can't do that. I got yeah. three. I'm going to be busy. He's like, but what song do you want to hear? And he would take, like people would request songs that weren't his. And some of like the like songs that are really hard to sing. Right. And he would just get up and, and, and he was like telling like, this is how I started. I was in a college bar and I would just take requests. And on the documentary that Kelly and I watch, a lot of the songs that stand out are not the songs that he's written, like Tiny Dancer by Elton John, Rocket Man by El- I mean, is it's the best version of Tiny Dancer I've ever heard. 
Garth Brooks singing it in some college bar when he's like 20. It's a, it's amazing. And he was doing that, like run, like he would sing like a verse or two of a song and kind of put his spin on it. But just to me, I looked at Kelly, I said, this is raw talent. This is also guts of steel, like confidence in yourself. Like it doesn't matter what you throw me. It would be like us in this business going into a big market and saying, throw us a sports topic. Doesn't, we don't know what it's going to be. Whatever you want to talk about, Lakers in the 80s or the New Orleans Saints going after Tyron Matthew, whatever it is, and us just sit there and, and show in. how we can make anything entertaining right. and enjoy it. But we also kind of have the chops and the knowledge to really dive in and talk about it. I thought for my money and, and it just the entertainment and the talent part of it was unmatched by Garth Brooks on Saturday night. I left there with so much respect for that guy as an entertainer, right? And I mean, like, it, all the all the pictures and images and videos that you see coming out of the place, you saw the place was jumping. I mean, it was on, bro. And I mean, some of the songs that he sang at certain points, I mean, it was as loud as any football game I've ever been to. When did you make the decision to go? Were you going before, or was it like kind of seat of the moment? Like, let's go see what Garth is all about. No, I thought when he when it was announced, I, I mean, I say we got to go to this. I mean, you don't get these opportunities to go watch a guy of his stature, Lloyd. I didn't know this. He sold more records in the '90s than Michael Jackson. I was totally, like, I was totally like, uninformed I didn't, like, on this. I, 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 I knew, I, I knew Garth Brooks was the dude. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I know he's the guy. I didn't know it was like that. Like, I didn't know like it was. He's bigger than the Beatles. Like by the numbers, he's bigger than Michael Jackson by the numbers. He's in Baton Rouge on a Saturday night in Tiger Stadium. We got to go see this. You know what I mean? Like it was. Who cares if you don't like the music? Who cares if you don't even like country music? You know, if you don't even like the genre. This is a once-in-a-lifetime type opportunity. But I hope, like I said, city officials, LSU, people had their eyes open to the fact of, look, we don't have to recreate Bayou Country Superfest where you got to bring in a bunch of C acts just to kind of get a, a 1A headliner. Just bring the A headliner in, sell the place out, and make it a night in Tiger Stadium. And, I mean, I can't imagine how much money they made. It was the rush hour. Why did you tell me this man rolls like this? Yes. Ricky Tan. But, I didn't, like, like I said, I totally missed the boat on this thing. And I was wondering how they were going to do the tickets and everything. Because the, the one that I think of is Kevin Hart selling out the Philadelphia Eagles Stadium for stand-up comedy. And I was wondering if they were going to do just seats on, on tight, like seats on the grass, essentially. Or if they're going to open the whole thing up and doing it production-wise, having the 360 view to where there's no bad seat in the house. For Garth was a, a great idea, and I'm one not to have anything other than football in Tiger Stadium, but it seems like this absolutely moved the needle for everyone, no pun intended, with the seismograph going off. But, I mean, is it just, is this a one-off? Is this one thing that you can only do just know. because it's Garth I don't know. calling maybe, Baton Maybe Rouge. you bring Garth back. Once I mean, a year? For 100,000 people, thing. I guarantee you 100,000 would be back. That's crazy. I mean, it was wild. Um, Probably best thing in Tiger Stadium since 2019. It's been it, uh, absolutely, absolutely, and especially when you look up and you see that LSU had 10 players drafted over the weekend. The struggles that LSU had on the football field for the last two seasons. Remember that conversation in the start to the show brought to you by Cajun Ready Mix Concrete online at CajunRMC.com. Get in touch with our friends over at Cajun Ready Mix Concrete for uh, for anything that you may be looking for, residential, municipal. Uh, any type of project that you may need, mention the Jordy Collada Show, and Cajun Ready Mix Concrete can take care of you. CajunRMC.com. Hunter Fournette, sports are a pretty cool topic. <laughs> Chill out, bro. Chill out. Hey, Cody's, Cody's got a little slack, man. 20 he's, minutes. He's, he, keeps 20 the, minutes. he keeps the show afloat. Um, but it was a great sports weekend. It was a, fanta it was a fantastic weekend for uh, South Louisiana. And the K. Doty walk-off yesterday I thought was a great kiss to the, the sports weekend for LSU, Baton Rouge, and everybody that was down here um, kind of experiencing it for the weekend. It's a huge win for Jay Johnson and his, his program. I think, you know, Georgia was coming in here with a little bit of buzz to him, um, and the two losses um, put Georgia now at 12-9 and in SEC play, which ties – LSU with the overall record, or excuse me, the conference record, Georgia 30 and 14 on the season. But this were two that LSU needed to get. They had struggled at home. They had really kind of 
found some some consistency. It felt like, but that they dropped the midweek game and they were able to pick it back up against Georgia for the three game set. Um, I, I just thought it was a it was a really good weekend for Jay Johnson. And, and you will and hear from Jay Johnson and Mike Up eleven nice. fifteen first guest on uh, eleven to one. Mike Up, Mikey Matuk will have Jay Johnson on on Monday, so we will have him and hear from the man himself. But I agree, Mikhail Hilliard has been the one that has been an absolute force whenever LSU needs it. You see what's happening with Blake Money. They thought he was the Friday night guy. It hasn't really worked out that way. You have Mikhail Hilliard, who wasn't, who couldn't sniff a start under Paul Maneri, but he's been the one guy that's been able to kind of stop the bleeding every time you need it. And it's, he, he worked on Wednesdays. He's done midweek games. He's come out of the bullpen. And now we've kind of found this role as a Friday night guy when he's been absolutely nails for LSU baseball. So this has been huge. Great win. Walk off. Maybe underrated a walk-off because you don't see it that often yeah but to have it happen on a on a Sunday get a win in the gold jerseys this might be the thing that LSU starts passing the sniff test a little bit when you get LSU baseball rolling like this uh Dylan Cruz hit one that I don't know if it's landed Two. yet yeah no but one of them was one. an absolute in bomb. the trees bro that was as long as a home or a deep as girth a could have caught it <laughs> I don't know if girth could even caught that one dude that was a I mean a missile hit by uh hit by Cruz yesterday um, but I mean, look, it's kind of that time of the year where you kind of start to kind of figure it out and LSU sun's coming out. This is usually the storyline of LSU baseball, right? Usually when school starts to break, you get into this, you know, summer Cowboy type of boots climate. Come out. Absolutely. Short shorts come yeah, out. The man. boys start showing That's off right. a little bit. Dresses are yeah. out. Everybody's kind of starting to <laughs> show up to the bit. box. Um, and you're finding your way from a pitching staff standpoint, uh, you mentioned Mikhail Hilliard. He has been one of the stories of the season, man, and this offense is really kind of starting to get, uh, you know, not not as much get it figured out because I think that they, they, they've had a really good season. It's just, um, you know, they're, they're, they're starting to play with some consistency. So, uh, huge win for, uh, for LSU baseball as uh, the Tigers uh, Take will. Take two or three, uh, man. That was huge. That was huge, man. That was big. LSU will be back in action on Tuesday uh, with uh, with Nichols at the box, and then um, this weekend the uh, the three game series. Uh, let me get this for you, uh, so I don't make sure and screw this up. Uh, <laughs> will be Alabama. They will be in Tuscaloosa for a uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday series versus the Tide uh, for uh, for LSU baseball. So a huge series win for Jay Johnson and the crew, and looking forward to uh, hearing. From uh, from Coach Johnson with Mikey Matuk. If you did not catch that interview last week, it was it was great. Uh, I mean, really kind of jumped into the baseball of it uh, with Matuk and Coach Johnson. So looking forward to getting that conversation back up and moving uh, here today. Uh, and then Mikey will have a special uh, promotion coming up for Cinco de Mayo. Yes, uh, doing a little Modesto. Yeah, be over at Modesto. Up. Yep. So we need some people to sign up. They're doing a cornhole tournament, I believe, for I think ten ten. Two man teams, two woman teams, whatever you want to do. I'm not a big cornhole guy, but it's going to be a blast. They're doing like a little shot clock variation of it, so it'll keep it moving. We're having, uh, so we need people to sign up. You can sign up with uh, Sean. Give him a shout at Modesto, my brother. I'll get his email in the chat. And uh, so we need some people to sign up for Cinco de Mayo. Free food, free drinks. Me, Mikey. We're wondering if Jared Mitchell might be back in time. He might be, might be back in town. We're going to have some of the boys over, so it'll be a good time. We'll be emceeing the thing and. Come have a couple more eggs and enjoy Cinco de Mayo with us. Uh, great weekend, as we said, for Jay Johnson and the crew taking two of three from Georgia. All of his studs showing out. De uh, Doty with the walk-off. Cruz with the two bombs yesterday. Barry hit one uh, over the weekend from the right side. Uh, Stevenson mashing the ball. So really starting to see some good things uh, from LSU baseball consistently. And then Matt McMahon, who we talked to on Friday, LSU head basketball coach. Uh, had a huge weekend. We had uh, and were able to have him on uh, going into the weekend, and he was talking about some of the success uh, that he was uh, able to get, like uh, like Jalen Reed uh, committing to uh, to LSU over the weekend. Uh, LSU picks up another big time recruit uh, as they pick up a five star uh, this time uh, with Tyrell Ward. Uh, committing to LSU just a few days after uh, grabbing Jalen Reed. Uh, Ward uh, was expected to choose Georgetown originally. He was, uh, he was really uh, recruited heavily by Kevin Nickelberry. Uh, this dude is a, uh, a straight-up freak athlete. I mean, a leaper, a jumper. Uh, he's got really good handles 
uh, as well. Can shoot the ball, can shoot it off the dribble. Um, look, he's just a high-end player. And you, you combine him with Jalen Reed uh, over the last couple of days, and it has been uh, tremendous news, tremendous outlook, tremendous work uh, coming from Matt McMahon and the LSU basketball program. To give you an idea, uh, now they've got 10 spots filled on that roster with just four left remaining here going into the summer and the offseason. This is way ahead of schedule, way ahead of the curve uh, than I initially thought they could get. Uh, so really, man, credit to, uh, to McMahon and, uh, and the entire staff uh, for having a chance to really get this stuff done. They are doing a lot of – I don't know if anybody's paying attention right now with everything that's been going on with LSU spring football – You've had some competition going on with the, um, you know, through spring football, some some spots that you're paying attention to, or LSU baseball starting to kind of hit the, um, you know, this this postseason push um, with the SEC tournament at the end of the month and regionals just about five weeks away. Um, but Matt McMahon and LSU basketball has been doing uh, tremendous work behind the scenes at building that roster, and if you did not listen to our interview on Friday. Go back and check it out, man. It was a really cool sit-down, about 20 minutes with the coach uh, on where he is now and um, you know where he is in the process of building this roster up. But if you're able to get four stars like Jalen Reed and five stars like Tyrell Ward, uh, like they were able to do over the last 72 hours, um, this you know um, period, grace period, that we were talking about for LSU basketball is not going to be – um, what we as, thought it as, was. as big of a window as, as you thought. Now, there's also talk that he could get Adam Miller to come back to school. And Adam Miller has kind of broke down his, his selections to a final two. Um, and it's TCU, Jamie Dixon, and the Horned Frogs, um, and Matt McMahon and LSU. And if he's able to pull Ace Wolf back into the fold with guys like Reed... Ward, you were able to retain Justice Williams, Mawani Wilkinson, and some of the new faces that are coming in with Matt McMahon. Um, well, I mean, look, man, a lot like we talked about with Brian Kelly, I think it's a similar storyline with Matt McMahon. I mean, with when they pulled the LSU football team pulled out of Houston, um, you know, following the bowl game, there wasn't a lot of us that that expected you know, the team and the program to be really competitive in the SEC in 2022-2023, right? But with the work that the entire staff, Brian Kelly, were able to do in bringing in 15 transfers, 16 transfers, signing a really good 15-man recruiting class with, you know, their backs up against the wall as far as the, the timeline was concerned and still being able to, you know, put together – uh, a really competitive group. Well, there's signs that, you know, LSU football is going to be able to compete in the fall. They should be able to compete and probably win some games they shouldn't and or at least be in some games that they got no business competitively being in. LSU basketball kind of feels like a similar story growing across the street, right? A month ago, if I tell you that, you know, right now they kind of look middle to kind of top of the pack in the SEC, that they could be competitive, now they're able to put another five-star into the mix, and you're saying, well, I mean, you know, you got a couple of spots left. They got four spots left that they're able to recruit at this level. I mean, I'm not expecting them to get four more five-stars, but, I mean, if they're showing that they can bring in guys of that caliber, well, I mean, let's Parker say— Parker Edwards can go back to bogeys. He's good. Yeah. Yeah. Let, <laughs> let, let, let's say you're, you're, you're able to pull a, another four-star— a good transfer, a high-level transfer, and you get Adam Wolf, you get Adam Miller. I mean, that's a that's a good competitive SEC team. Now I know you look around the league. Oscar Tashibway's coming back in Lexington. They're preseason number one in Arkansas. You know, Florida's putting together some good stuff over in Gainesville under their new coach and Todd McDonald. I mean, it's you know you know you know what's going on in 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 Tuscaloosa with Nate Oates. Um, Mississippi State's got a new coach. I mean, Georgia's got a new coach. I mean, there's a lot of change, South Carolina, a lot, of, a lot of change in the league. But from where LSU is, especially where they were coming from, 
Um, I mean, we had him dead and buried. Storyline has changed. Sure. I mean, they didn't have a roster. They didn't have players. And now within two weeks of that conversation, they've got 10 roster spots filled with some really high-end talent. Okay. You know, kind of like what we talked about with LSU football. I mean, didn't seem like it was going to be competitive a couple of months ago. But after, you know, I mean, they, they roll their sleeves up and get the work done. You look at the roster, you step back and see some storylines in spring and say, hmm, maybe, maybe they can figure it out. Does LSU basketball have more to sell than we thought, or is this all McMahon and his staff putting it, like putting it together and being able to recruit? Because when you have Efton Reed being able to transfer to Gonzaga, you would think that Adam Miller would have more viable offers than just TCU and LSU, but it seems like he's been sold on LSU a little bit to be able to want to stick around at least because whenever he hit the portal, I thought he was gone. Like yeah. I never thought this was even an opportunity he would seek out, but it's down to the final two. And if he's going to name LSU in the final two, doesn't it feel like he's going to pick LSU? I would think that LSU would have a lead there, or at least have an advantage in that in that um, in that pool. But you know, I mean, I think that this is a lot of of Matt McMahon and his staff just working. I really do. I I mean, look, I, I've said, and Brett Drago uh, or uh, Drago, Dagro, uh says, when does LSU find out about possible NCAA penalties? I, I don't know if they find out in the next. Six months. I really, I don't know if you find out before next basketball season, but I have said on record, I do believe that the NCAA is not really worried about LSU anymore. They got, they got their pound of flesh. They got what they were looking for. I mean, it's actually probably worked out better for the NCAA than they could have imagined. I mean, all they really wanted was Will Wade, and Wade had pissed them off so much that. They didn't mind seeing the program suffer if it meant that they had to get Wade. But after, you know, all of the dust has now settled from the Wade saga and Wade is out and his top assistant, Bill Armstrong, is out and everybody that was at LSU during that time that was in question from an administrative standpoint, even the president of the school and F. King Alexander, Joe Oliva, all of those characters that were around during that time are out. Wade's gone, Armstrong's gone, and the, and, and the roster is gone. I mean, Darius Days was the only one that was tied to that time of LSU basketball that was even around. He's now gone. I mean, everybody that was there during that time period that the NCAA was crusading against LSU basketball and trying to get Will Wade is over. And... All of the people that were around during that time are out. And the one that they wanted, the Golden Goose and Will Wade, is done. So from LSU's standpoint, I think that they've really got a good case, especially when you look at the state of the NCAA now. I mean, the place is falling apart. It will not exist as we know it by football season. I mean, they're changing the entire structure and bylaws of it. Mark Emmert got an extension last summer. He's gotten fired this summer or resigned, stepped down, whatever you want to call it. But, I mean, the entire structure is done. It's changing. The, even the arm that apparently got LSU was like whatever it was, the special arms case that Condoleezza Rice put together, that's dissolving. Like, you're seeing this happen slowly on like a case-by-case -case basis of – you're watching the NCAA disappear just in slow moves. They're playing chess while they go away. It's been a slow burn to see the NCAA go away. If you have no Mark Embrett, then who do you – I mean, who would you – like we talked about last week, who even wants to step in and take that job? If you're not going to really do anything, and Mark Embrett is – we don't know if he was forced to leave or asked to leave or he just quit, but there's really no expectation for the, from the NCAA. They got LSU, and that seemed to be their last test case of what they wanted to do. They and wanted now Wade. Now it's over. Yeah, they got Will Wade, and now it feels like they, they proved their worth, and it's over. They didn't want LSU basketball. Wade was the they head the coach of LSU basketball. They wanted Wade. Wherever he was, they were going to get him. And they got him. I don't think that they're concerned about the program. They may scrap a couple of scholarships. And, you know, coming out of the last five years, if that's all it is, fine. Hand them over and move on. 
But I really believe that the NCAA has gotten everything that they've wanted from LSU. And from a just structural standpoint now, they can't even, they're not even built for this anymore. They're not even built to levy the penalties. I mean, the entire organization is evaporating. They're changing up their entire structure. New bylaws, new personnel, new people, new committees, new outlook. I don't know why you would retroactively go back to what you've always been criticized for and try to strike some penalty down when, in the grand scheme of it, you've gotten everything you've wanted. The NCAA's never made any sense, so if it happened, I guess nobody would be surprised. But that's how I feel it plays out. I think that the NCAA's got all that they've wanted. They got Wade. Wade's out. And they may nix a couple of scholarships for LSU. But outside of that, I mean, I don't see any type of postseason ban, any type of penalty that's going to really severely set the program back. So if McMahon can continue to build this competitive roster, LSU's going to be a tough out. I mean, year one, they're going to be a tough out because they're putting players in. And that was our concern the entire time. Can they get players? Can they attract players? And not saying, can they attract players because of the coach? Can they attract players because what are they selling? And maybe behind closed doors, and we asked this to McMahon, you know, kind of straight up on Friday. And I mean, this isn't something that you would, you would admit openly, I guess, at this point. But I wonder if they do have an idea, kind of behind closed doors or behind, you know, the the, the public eye of what's coming down. At some point, the Mark Emmert, Scott Woodward relationship has to kind of bear some fruit on that. You know what I mean? Like, hey, man, give me some inside info. We've given you everything you've wanted. What's going to happen here? I mean, we're trying to recruit from LSU standpoint if you're Scott Woodward talking to Emmert. And maybe Emmert doesn't know now. I mean, it seems like he's kind of a, he's been a dead man walking. So... We'll see, man. I, I think that year one for LSU is um, very intriguing to look at and to um, you know try and judge where they might be. And I think it'll give you a really good idea of the style and the capability and the coach that you hired. You know, I mean, there's there, there's nothing worse than being a really good coach with a really bad team from a personnel standpoint. You have them in the right spot. They just can't get there and make shots, make passes, or dribble the ball. You put these guys on the floor, you're competitive, and your coaching tactics can be proven. So I think this is a, a really good – man, there's a lot of good signs around LSU basketball trending towards the offseason. I didn't think that they would have 10 players on the roster by May. I really didn't. May 1st. You're seeing both ends of the transfer portal, too, how it can giveth and taketh away. You know, they LSU loses almost its entire roster, but McMahon rolls his sleeves up, gets to work, starts recruiting, and then if you're able to, like, same thing with Brian Kelly, like you were saying, this was this would nearly be impossible if the rules weren't in place as they are with the transfer portal and being able to pull people in one year, like, essentially, you can overturn it, overhaul an entire roster in a year. LSU had, what, 35 people on on the football team whenever they played against Kansas State? Yeah. And now you're able to bring in, almost get it to 85 on football, and then you have basketball being able to pull in maybe even Adam Miller saying LSU's in his top two. That tells me that there's a message worth selling there that he's even considering it because whenever it started and you saw Will Wade leave and then you saw the mass exodus, Matt McMahon's been able to pull in at least to get their attention of what he's selling, people are buying it. So that's, a, I mean, that's a huge coup for LSU basketball in my mind. I mean, if you look at the roster right now, you got a point guard in, in, um, in, in Justice Williamson. Um, Justice Williams. Justice Williams. I'm sorry. Um, I guess he could be a, con, a combo guard too. I guess Justice Hill would be a point guard as well. The going to be young. Yeah, he will be young. Uh, but college basketball is a young man's game. Absolutely. Um, combo guards, you got Justice Williams, 
uh, the Trey Hannibal guy that transferred in, Cam Hayes to transfer. You know, you got wings in Milwaukee Wilkinson, forward Derek Fountain from Mississippi State, Jalen Reed, uh, the four star signee, Kendall Coleman, the transfer from Northwestern, Cornelius Williams is is your center. I mean, they need some help from a big man standpoint. And as we said, Efton Reed announced that he's going to Gonzaga uh, over the weekend. He announced on his social media that he'd be transferring out of LSU uh, on to uh, Do you think that Gonzaga's LSU campus. made a pitch to oh, keep yeah, him? Oh, yeah, for okay. sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, we still haven't learned what Sharif is going to do. So, I mean, um, it'll be interesting to see what, what, what Sharif decides uh, as well. Um, cause if you can bring back Adam Miller, who didn't get any real playing time, I'd imagine the injuries maybe hurt his recruiting in terms of what teams are looking at it. But it, it feels like after what he did with USA basketball, that he would have had major looks because he was the best player on the, but under 21 team for USA basketball, they won the gold medal. He was the leading scorer. All of it was trending in a very positive direction. But if you're able to bring back Sharif and... Adam Miller, that's you got a little bit of a squad there. That's a start. And the recruiting that's going on, LSU basketball, put it on the poll. Do you think that, that an NCAA tournament bid is viable this year? With that roster, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, if you were able to get Sharif, Adam Miller, and two more impact players, I mean, that's that's so much more than you could ever ever asked for in year one for Matt McMahon. I mean, we were staring Parker Edwards in the face. <sighs> like a month ago. 28 minutes of Parker <laughs> Edwards a night. He didn't want that more than no, we did. Hell he, no, hell no. He's trying to go out. He's got a reputation to uphold. What do you mean to be a player? I got to be in bogeys oh, tonight, yeah, Coach. I've walk- got the walk-on scholarship. What do you want from me? Uh, RMB Builders brings you all of our podcasts and all of our sound back to you. Let the team over at RMB build your dream home today. They got... Uh, open communication and easy availability. Your home will become the heart and the place where all of your most treasured memories happen. RMB Builders can make that happen today. Just log online at rmb-builders.com. Whether you are building, buying, or you want to remodel a project, get in touch with RMB Builders. Rhett Bourgeois and his team are over there. Uh, over there are ready for uh, getting in contact with you today, or get in contact with them. Uh, easiest way to do that is to log online, rmb-builders.com. rmb-builders.com is where you can find them. Tell Rhett and the crew that you heard it right here on the Jordy Collada Show as they bring back all of our podcasts as well. Any sound that you miss, uh, anything that uh, you miss throughout the day, RMB brings that back to you. Uh, great website for RMB if you're looking for uh, some of the work that they've done, uh, some of the uh, testimonials from uh, happy clients in the past, Find out more from RMB online at rmb-builders.com. All right, the NFL draft uh, has uh, has come and gone here uh, for the NFL calendar. Now it's the NFL offseason. A lot of cool storylines happening around Bat Rouge, but uh, was anybody shocked to see that LSU had the second most players drafted in this NFL draft during this cycle? I mean, think about where LSU has been the last three seasons of this draft cycle. Let's just call it the last three years of the guys that went in early or guys that were in and were and, and were draftable at LSU. You got 2019, obviously, the national championship season where um, some of these guys that were drafted over the weekend were freshmen like Derek Stingley Jr. Or even guys that were seniors like Damone Clark. But then you've got the last two seasons where they've won 11 football games They've struggled. They've had guys opting out. They've had all types of stuff going on with the program. I mean, you had Ogeron, you had Panamski. I mean, the place was a shit show for the last two years. But one thing that we can all now put the debate to bed over is whether or not LSU had talent. And I don't know how much that was out there, but there was, well, it's you're down. You're down in areas. You know, recruiting hasn't been as high. And then you look up on the NFL draft weekend and see that 10 (laughs) players have come off the board from LSU. Offensive linemen, specialists, defensive linemen, DBs. Kind of every level of the football team. Running back. Ty Davis-Price goes in the third round. Cordell Flott goes in the third round. 
Neil Farrell coming off the board. Ed Ingram, a second round pick. Cade York goes in the fourth. You're a kicker. I mean, LSU was good over the last couple of seasons. Talent was not the issue. Talent was not the problem. And I'm not here to dump on the past leadership. It was just surprising for me to see. I don't know if it was for you. Let me know inside of the chat what you think when you saw LSU had 10 players drafted only behind Georgia, who put 15 in the draft. Georgia was loaded. National champions. I mean, they had the number one player in the draft that didn't even play. I mean, he was a specialist. <laughs> he came in on third downs. I mean, it was just, it, it, I mean, the best player on their team, Nicobe Dean, was a second round pick on the defense. Um, but, I mean, as much as we dump on Edo, you have to give him credit that he was able to find talent. He just can't coach talent. That was the issue. But if you're. If you're a different team, obviously the bridge has been burned at LSU. But if you're a college football program, don't you see that and put him in a role where, hell, Ed Orgeron can recruit the hell out of these kids and identify talent. If we keep him in a role like that, then he's good to go. Or is he not able to get over his own ego and kind of play second fiddle to any program or any head coach after he's tasted that life? I don't know. I mean, that would be a question for him. Um, but, you know, I mean— Call Football him. coaching is is a pretty ego driven game. I don't know if you can. I mean, we've seen ask his somebody, ego on display. I don't right? know if you can ask somebody to go from the corner office to the the back, you know, from the penthouse to the outhouse, back to the to, to the to the 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 other offices. Um, but if you just put him in a role of defensive yeah. line and recruiting again, like it, I mean, you've seen him sniffing around Miami, which is a place he has like, you know, he's kind of thrown some seeds around. And he got his start almost essentially. I mean, if he's not going to be able to be a head coach again, he has to get he has to recognize that. And if he's able to go to a USC or Miami where he's laid kind of his groundwork before, I'd imagine he'd be a force because the man could recruit. Obviously, and you saw, yeah, like he's, I mean, ten people drafted second to the national champion Georgia Bulldogs, and LSU was fighting for bowl eligibility with that with that roster. Like he's going to be able to. Accrue talent. It's just a matter if he can swallow his own pride a little bit. It'll be interesting to see, man, because um, I don't know if he can get back to that. I don't know if I, I don't know if there's contract language that prevents him from doing that somewhere within the SEC. Like well, that's going why Miami makes staff. a lot of sense. Miami makes a lot of sense. Uh, USC would make a lot of sense, uh, I but I just don't. Work for I just Lincoln. don't know if you can. I don't know if he could take that step back. I don't know. If it would be, um, I just don't know if, it, if 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 he would be open to that. Um, but he would be great at it. He continues. I mean, that's that's where he thrived. If you remember, I mean, there was a come on in, Katie. Um, Hello. Good morning. Yeah. Um, there would be. I don't know how we got here. I mean, if you remember, I mean, before he took the interim job, there was a cult like following behind him when he was the defensive line coach and the recruiting coordinator. I mean, that was when he was able to endear himself um, to the fan base more than ever, right? In that role where he was prideful around the university, he was out recruiting, he was kind of boots on the ground. There were stories that coming out of coaching offices of him getting in like a four-point stance against recruits. And I mean, just stuff that was making him very likable. And all of that works if you're not the head coach. Absolutely. And the defensive line coach can jog down – the river road without his shirt off. Right. Like with no problem. <laughs> you know, I mean the, the 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 defensive line coach can go to Destin and jog around the beach with no shirt on. He can be out on a Saturday before the game. You're just right. the defensive line coach. The head coach cannot. No. I mean the head coach can I mean the defensive line coach can even kind of bum around LA the day before the game. You know what I mean? Like I mean with with and yell at people with a blonde. You know what I mean? Like if you want it, like he can see like, his shirt all he wants. If you want oh to God. but as the head coach you can't really do that, you know. What I mean, or not can't really. You can't, can't do that. I mean, you just can't do it at all. So wait, where's he going? I missed nowhere. the beginning. Nowhere. Um, we we're just looking at LSU had ten players drafted. Oh, that's where y'all got on this. the second most. <laughs> the second most by any college in the NFL draft, only behind Georgia, who mm. had an NFL team. Um, 
So, you know, I mean, look, I, I'm not trying to spin it to bang on anybody and pour and dump on anybody because no. it was a good weekend for the program. It's just, it's shocking to look up. And there was a lot of, maybe not a lot, but there was a quiet, uh, or excuse me, a loud minority of people that saying that LSU's talent is down. Oh, really? I mean, for anybody that was saying and claiming that LSU didn't have talent over the last couple of seasons, the NFL draft weekend doesn't lie. Yeah, that's a dumb take. Right? Yeah, absolutely. That was just, <laughs> I mean, it, 10 blew my mind. I didn't think there was 10 draft ten. players yeah. just because I watched LSU football all I mean, year. I mean, ten. I knew they were, the, the talent was there. Yeah. But for the NFL to speak that, like, that speaks yeah. volumes for Ed Ingram to go in the second oh my round. God, yes. And what was the weakest part of LSU football aside from coaching? Like, oh, the O line stinks. And it's like, oh, no, actually, you have second rounders on that. <laughs> exactly. Like, Chase and Hines and Austin Deculus were also drafted. <laughs> you know so what I mean? I'm like, for Austin. Yeah, he was the calculus. Happy. Did y'all see his Instagram? And he's, like, standing on the fence, like, with his head down, just emotional. Yeah, man, so that's great. Crushing boudin balls. Uh, I felt best for Andre Anthony. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That made me want to cry. Seventh rounder to Tampa Bay. I mean. And he'll stick. Go make the squad. <sighs> yes. Go, just let me out go there. Go get it out there. Bro. Can we get him on? Uh, yeah, we can get ready to get it back. Yeah, we'll go to go for the IV, and he'll be there. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and Fresh Chef Kitchen also. Oh, nice. He gets all his meals made there. New sponsor alert. Um, new sponsor alert. We will tell you about new Fresh uh our new, our newest addition to our, our sponsors, Fresh Kitchen, which we're very much looking forward to. Early morning bike rides and Fresh Kitchen breakfasts sound awesome. Ooh, yeah. Uh, that delivery we should today? start a biking squad. <laughs> a biking squad. We should, yeah, we should all we get a tandem. 5 a.m., who's in? <laughs> I can't. I, fiz- I cannot do that. <laughs> um, some other players that came off the board for LSU, obviously Derek Stingley Jr. was the third overall pick to the Houston Texans uh, over the weekend. Uh, it was good to see Sting come out of the top five. Uh, the next player that went was in the second round, Ed Ingram, to the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, then you saw a, a, a flurry uh, in the third round with Cordell Flott going to the New York Giants. Ty Davis Price was a late third round selection to the San Francisco 49ers. Man, my uncle lives in San Francisco and called me about that. He's like, wow. what do you know about this kid? Because everybody here is really excited. And I was like, oh, my God, he is amazing. He's a great kid. He, that is a um, great get for them. And then you've got two Louisiana kids now in the backfield for San Francisco. Um, Elijah Mitchell and oh, Ty yeah. Davis Price. Yeah, yeah. Elijah That's Mitchell so and Ty cool. Davis Price are the two Louisiana tandem backs now out west. And then in the fourth round, uh, we mentioned Cade York. The kicker went to Cleveland. Defensive Oof. tackle, tough Neil play, Farrelly. That's a, ki- a tough kick. place to kick. Yeah, he'll <laughs> cut his teeth immediately. Uh, <laughs> outdoors in the cold weather. Uh, <laughs> Neil no Farrell went to Vegas oh, in no. the fourth round. Uh, He's got to stay. Damone Didn't have Clark to go is, a, is a cowboy, uh, which I love the fit there. Obviously, we talked, a, we, we talked a little bit about okay. the, the Cowboys aren't afraid to take chances on injured players, yeah. as we saw with the, the former Notre Dame linebacker that they drafted, and now... Katie gets Damone Clark for her Cowboys. They're so. looking to win. Okay. Uh, they are. Since 92. They were very yeah. strategic <laughs> with this. Yeah, right. Michael Irvin ain't walking through that door. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, jerks. Yeah, um, jerks. And then uh, Austin Deculus and uh, Chase and Hines were, uh, were two offensive linemen that went back-to-back. And uh, edge rusher Andre Anthony was, uh, was the 10th uh, and final player uh, for, uh, for LSU to come off the board. But a very... A uh, successful draft weekend for uh, for LSU football, one that you can definitely sell team won uh, six on games. the recruiting trail. What's that? The team won six games. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> it's nuts. So frustrating. Ten pros. Ten pros. Ten pros. Third overall pick. Can't play. Amazing. Well, I mean, I've been listening to a lot of draft podcasts, and, I mean, the Stingley question marks are still there. You know, like people are wondering what player – Houston is getting is it going to be the 2019 edition and everybody is unanimous that if you're getting the 2019 edition everybody is all in fully in and I mean the 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 accolades and um you know really the uh, just the bouquets that they throw at his season in 2019 I mean I've heard GMs and scouts call him the best player in college football in 2019 the best defender in college football the best player on LSU's team in 2019 outside of Burrow um, you know, but right there in the same vein as Burrow having the, you know, that type of effect on a game, the way that he affected the game as a freshman when he was playing DB. And then uh, obviously the drop off is concerning for a lot of people over the next two seasons. Uh, but as we 
kind of speculated, and as we talked a little bit about Stingley, once they saw him at Pro Day, a lot of people's anxiety was calmed by just his physical ability. Eighty percent of him, right? Um, and you know, football is a very arrogant game, and there is defensive minds and coaches that look at that talent, and they just can't. They can't help themselves. It makes you, I mean, it's salivating. It's it's just the ability to have a player like that that at any point can, you know, change the game like he has the ability to do. It's just way too tempting to stay away from. And that's ultimately what and why Stingley went so high in the draft was he's just naturally too gifted of a athlete and football player and, you know, a lot of people brought to light, which I think is fair, is that, you know, some of these these football people that were talking about, I listened to the Ringer podcast on the NFL draft. I listened to Rosillo's wrap-up of the NFL draft with Booger McFarlane. He sat down with Booger in his latest, to tell you what um, <laughs> in his latest draft podcast. Rosillo did. Um, and I also uh, listened to... Um, Pro Football Focus's podcast, and they all had a section speaking about Stingley in there. And as Booger pointed out, and as they pointed out on, I believe it was the PA, uh, the PFF podcast, of they've all known, football people at the highest level have known about Stingley since he's been about 16 years old. Some of them were talking about that they knew a little bit about him further back because they had relationships with his dad in arena football and they would go around there and he was always kind of around the locker room, around the practice field, around just the team. And people kind of compared. They weren't using names, but they said that they have seen these types of cases before where you have a prodigy, you have somebody at a very young age that looks, feels, and has the talent and skill level of an NFL player. Adrian Peterson was somebody that they referenced. Like a lot of people said that Peterson coming out of high school could have been an NFL back. Stingley had that same type of cachet to him when he came out of the Dunham School that, I mean... He's ready now. He's ready now to do this. Um, and people talk, you know, in, in hearing some of these these talking heads, the people with experience talk about that path is so difficult to stay on. If you leave high school and people are telling you physically and skillfully, you're ready. You're ready to go. At the hardest position probably to be that. Then you get to the next level and succeed like Peterson did as a freshman, like Stingley did as a freshman. And how difficult that is to coach against and keep motivated and on track to be a top five pick. And both of them, what? I, I, don't, I don't want to take you off track, but Eli Ricks got arrested last night. Yeah, no, I saw Okay. I saw <laughs> they were um, talking about that in the yeah, chat. I figured y'all talked about that's it. Not, that's not our deal. I mean, no, no, I just, I just I blew hate my hear mind. Yeah. I hate to hear it. But I hate to see it. I guarantee you he will be playing game one for Alabama. No doubt. Was All it right. weed? Um, yep. It's speeding. Speeding and weed. No insurance. Speeding and weed. <laughs> um, Sativa. <laughs> but how hard that is for guys like Stingley, Peterson, those types of players. Leonard. Leonard Fournette. Uh, even a guy like George Pickens, who was drafted in the second round by the Pittsburgh Steelers after a lot of adversity. I mean, Pickens was, it was Pickens and Stingley three years ago on the seven on seven circuit. They would stop drills, they would stop games on the seven on seven circuit when those two were going up against one another in those, those, those off season camps. And, and, you know, Pickens was kind of what Derek Stingley was as a wide receiver, you know, or what Derek Stingley was as a cornerback. Pickens was kind of perceived to, to be as a, a as a wideout, he's kind of always been that his entire life. Um, when you saw it when he came in against LSU yeah. in the second half, he immediately made an impact. But Stingley to be able to walk this path, like you said, with I mean, you have to. I know a lot of flack maybe has been thrown at the dad's way, but when you have a football prodigy like that that you've built, like he deserves a lot of credit for keeping him kind of on that path. And while it was tenuous at LSU, 
this was the ultimate goal. He was getting him ready for the NFL. Mm-hmm. And you talk about LSU has 10 players drafted, but look at the coaching situation. It was just untenable for somebody like Stingley to be able to kind of walk that path here. He was, get me, get me the hell out of town. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, get me to the league because this is not – I mean, we've had – Moffitt on who said with uh, Mikey Ma took and mic'd up. He knew he was fired after game one against yeah. UCLA. And he's like, this is it's it's not going to end well. It's not going to end well, and it's not my fault. Like, yeah. I'm going to take – I'll take the blame because I love LSU. But the way that this program was run under Ed Orgeron, they were running players into the ground, mm-hmm. and he saw Absolutely. it. And Stingley had to have some sort of, you know, second coming with the dad to be like, dude. Let's get out of here. Get out of here. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have to understand, too, how much – of a not not so much and it was it, a turnoff for the players on what the coach was doing or at least the perception that he was putting out there right i mean like think about what a football locker room is think about what a football facility is it is a 24 hour 7 day a week um just it, it you're you're steadily held accountable I mean, think about what a lot of these players have told us about what Brian Kelly's program is. They are keeping track of every single thing that they do, showing up on time for workouts, showing up on volleyball games on campus to support the school, going to class, grades, vitamins, nutrition, working out, practice, making sure that you're available, video study. I mean, they are tracking every single thing that you do and they're also telling you that they are tracking that right so if they're tracking you and in the public they're tracking the coach and the coach is on social media laying in the bed jogging the streets doing all of what was being put out from lsu football during that time how much those guys are saying, I'm not buying into what they're selling. Well, I can do whatever the hell I want. I'm not, I'm not listening to, you know, people beat the drum and one team, one heartbeat and all that stuff. And then looking up and seeing really what it is. I'm out of here. I'm not, I'm not dealing with this stuff. My future is secure if I can stay out of this mess and it's not worth what it could mean to a guy like Stingley in the future to really put up with that stuff. And I know that people don't want to hear that. You know what I mean? That it came down to really kind of an individual decision in a team sport that you care about that specific team. And you pay your tradition funds and you buy your tickets and you buy your parking passes. You don't want to hear that the superstar is saying, you know what, I'm out. I'm not interested in this stuff. But you also have to hold the program accountable and say, if they've got leadership and coaches that aren't really pushing their own message or pushing the message but not showing that they're bought into the message, then how can you blame the player? How can I be held accountable whenever the head coach isn't accountable? Exactly. Um, Greg, uh, Greg Brooks is going to be here about 9 a.m., um, we're going to talk to Garrett Nussmeyer this morning around, uh, around 845. Um, so hopefully we'll have some fun with those two guys in studio with us as, uh, this morning we'll talk a lot about LSU football and kind of the future and what the expectation is. What was the expectation for a guy like Nussmeyer, uh, on bowl night and not, and we won't ask him about, he's already talked about the playing stuff. And as I don't know if people want to hear about that anymore, but I mean, that was, a, that was another individual decision made for the betterment of both the player and the program on Nussmeyer's point. What, what, what would have Nussmeyer really accomplished playing in that game versus Kansas State other than blowing his red shirt and probably getting blown up behind that offensive line that had no interest in being there? It came down to an individual decision because the program was so out of whack from the leadership. Why would I burn a year under a coach that's not going to be here? Exactly. Like, it doesn't make any sense. And I'm sure you've seen Nussmeyer already. Like, his competitiveness is there. That's not what you're concerned about. It was right. more about just, like we talk about, like this, the last year was cooked. Season was over. No need to burn a year of your eligibility when 
in his mind, he didn't even know he was probably going to be here. You know, the portal was probably a very real option for him. And now you see why. He's vying for a starting job whenever he was almost written off. You bring back Miles Brennan, you add another transfer quarterback in Jane Daniels, and Nussmeier's like, boys, I got, I got the goods. <laughs> I can play here. And that's why you don't burn your eligibility on a, a meaningless game, essentially. It'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see what uh, um, you know, just kind of where 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 they are on that now. I mean, that that stuff was so, golly, it was it was permeating the the program, right? Where I mean, yeah, look at what you had. You had you had all these guys that were were talented and 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 could play at a high level. But you just didn't have the leadership to put them in the right spot. Now you do. Now it feels like you won't have a lot of the similar problems that you once had um, that LSU was dealing with. Remember, Daily, we're brought to you by Relief Med. R E L E A F Med.com. Relief Med is uh, located over there on online at uh, ReliefMed.com. Uh, but you can pick up your medical marijuana today if you just get in touch with Relief Med and you find out that you have. Uh, one of the issues that could get you the medical marijuana uh, recommendation. Call them at 2 a.m. Uh, yes. You. If, you, uh, if you can blink and breathe, obviously, uh, you will I just want uh, the you hat. Will probably have. Uh, <laughs> you will Wait, probably what? have a symptom. Johnny Drama from Entourage. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to get this goddamn hat. <laughs> uh, relief Med. Use the promo code Jordy1. Jordy1. J-O-R-D-Y-1 to keep uh, 20% off. Of, uh, of your Relief Med stay today. R-E-L-E-A-F med.com is where you find them online. Cody Boudreaux with the $10 Super Chat says, Jordy Collada Show killed it with the interviews last week, especially with uh, Makai Wingo and our guy Miles Frazier. Uh, what time does Nuss come on today? Nuss will be here at 8.45 this morning, and then Greg Brooks will be in uh, right around that same time, around 9 o'clock. So hopefully we can have a similar type of sit-down and discussion with those two about spring ball, what the outlook is, uh, and uh, what the offseason is going to look like for, uh, for LSU. Uh, speaking of the offseason, NBA playoffs is in full swing right now, man. If mm. you're not keeping up with this, uh, with the Pelicans, right? Uh, look, the Pelicans were bounced over the weekend, but I thought that uh, they're still making some news. Our friend Fletcher Mackle on Friday asked Zion Williamson specifically if he had the chance to sign the Supermax extension, would he do it? Zion did not even blink, said he can't wait to do it. Uh, he wouldn't even uh, just it was very good news uh, for the Pelicans. David Griffin had a press conference uh, over the weekend uh, saying and it was asked about some similar things. And I think, you know, kind of give you an idea. It's going to be this thing's not going to be as easy as as we maybe anticipate with you just offering the contract and he's going to sign it. Talking about Zion, um, there's going to have to be some protectors, some clauses for the team against this injury. And from Zion's standpoint and the NBA standpoint, you a lot of the time you see um, these super max contracts be insured. They're insured to kind of go against if anything like what Zion has dealt with happens where he blows out his foot, he can't go. Odds are you're losing out on not only the you know, the jersey sales, the ticket sales of missing the player, uh, but you're probably losing out on some revenue for the entire franchise, so you have that money recouped by insurance. After the players dealt with an injury, it's tough to get those contracts insured. So there's going to have to be some negotiation between the Pelicans and Zion side to kind of come to an agreement where it may not be the ultimate supermax which I think is what, like $195 million over the next Jeez. four years for Zion? Nice. When he's making, you know, $30 million off the court in endorsements. I mean, he's, he's set to have a huge payday. But there's some language that needs to be agreed upon as far as, you know, some protectors for the franchise on injuries to keep New Orleans kind of safe over the next couple of seasons. I still think this gets done. I still think that it pretty easily gets done. I mean, I think if they, they negotiate some things in with some, some injury, you can still guarantee like over $90 million of the contract. So it's not as if he's going to miss out 
on generational type money, but he may not be able to get as high of a guarantee. Like, I think Joel Embiid had a similar contract. When Joel Embiid was asked to sign his contract extension as a rookie, the max deal, they built in some qualifiers that protected Philadelphia because Joel was, he was so hurt the first couple of years in the league that they wanted to commit to him. They knew if they committed to him and it worked out from a health standpoint, they were getting an MVP caliber type player, somebody that could change the the direction of the franchise, but he was just, he was too fragile from an injury standpoint to commit all of that money without having some protection in the language to give yourself an out from the franchise standpoint. Did you still want him? Absolutely. Did you want to build the franchise around him? No doubt about it. Were you a little cautious because of where he had come from from a physical standpoint? 100%. And I think that's exactly where the Pelicans are. They want Zion. They want to commit to Zion. They want to build the thing almost around Zion, or at least with Brandon Ingram and some of these young superstars. But they're a little cautious about what the injury could mean to the contract down the line. And they want to protect themselves there. And you can't blame them. No, you can't blame them. When does he have? When's the deadline? For July first. Okay. But I don't even know if this. You know, I mean, this this may creep a little bit past. July 1st is not the deadline. July 1st is the opening to when he can sign this. But as we've seen, NBA, NFL, they obviously get this stuff done. You'll know before the July 1st window Mm -hmm. who's signing where, who's agreeing to terms on what. But this in particular might creep a little bit past July 1st just because of some of that language they got to work out. Like I said, I think it happens. I think that there's too much interest on both sides. The Pelicans have made up so much ground as far as making themselves an attractive franchise to a person like Zion. I mean, the Pelicans feel like the young, cool, hip team in the league. Like, why would you want to leave if you have the opportunity to stay with the Pelicans? They got a great coach. They got a good nucleus. The city seems to be, you know, engulfed in in in, in pride for the, the the franchise. I mean, I saw more. Pelican shirts yesterday at Jazz Fest than I did anything. New Orleans is a basketball city now. I mean, they just win. <laughs> I know. It's exciting. I love it. Well, it's kind of a changing of the guard when you think about it. You look yeah. at what's happening with the Saints, mm-hmm. and you lose Sean Payton. You lose kind of the era that I started know. fandom in New Orleans with kind of the run with no Sean, P- no Sean Payton, no Drew Brees. And now you have this up-and-coming team with the Pelicans that feels a lot like the early Saints did in 2006. It's I very, know. like, it's exciting. It is. And I don't, do you think that if they don't go on that run and it's not as compelling as it was in the playoffs that Zion is still considering this? Or do you feel like he was all in from the get? Um, no, you mean, like, the, the, the Zion story, man, is weird because, I mean, if you think back to last offseason, he did not engage in anything. He was up in, at, at Raleigh Durham. He was up on Duke's campus. I mean, he was kind of acting like a college kid. He was making up for a lot of lost time, I guess, for, for his time at Duke. He went to Vegas during the summer league while the Pelicans was there. He never showed up to anything that the Pelicans were doing. Yeah, y'all were sure that he was out. I think last summer at this time he was. Mm-hmm. And I think – that Willie Green meant a lot. And, I mean, like, I read where Ronnie Vinson, the old assistant coach, and Brandon Ingram called Zion to either watch the draft together or watch the playoffs together. It was something where – and he just ghosted him. Like, he didn't even – he didn't even text him, like, to say, That's weird. I'm not no. showing up. No, like, yeah. he told him I was coming. And then and never showed up and then never – and it was like, yo, where are you at? And like – didn't respond. It was like, <laughs> you like, up? Just, I'm in Portland, yeah, Oregon. Straight up, just straight up. Like, you up? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, what's the deal, man? Uh, we're all, we're all, the, the food's here. Her, you know what I mean? Not, the Mountain Dew and Cheetos are here. Yeah. Um, so, you know what I mean? Like, I, I think last year it was bad. Like, it was in a bad place. Yeah, it was a bad spot last year. Um, you know, like, the, the, the story with Griffin, like, planting the piano. I mean, it was just weird. <laughs> it was a lot weird. of weird things were going on, yeah. It was strange. It serenaded it's him. It's a completely um, different situation now, I feel like, though. It's 100% completely different. And I think that Willie Green deserves so much credit. I think Griff deserves credit, too, by some of the moves that he's made with, you know, getting Jonas Valanciunas and the draft, obviously, with, with Tickling the Arab ivories. And... Um, <laughs> You know, Jose Alvarez and 
uh, Trey Murphy. I mean, all these guys seem to be really good fits. Brandon Ingram kind of coming into his own as a superstar. There's just a lot to be excited about with there New Orleans. Is. And um, I think Zion obviously fits in, and um, he'll try and find – you know, I think that the Pelicans will try and find some protection in the in the language to make sure that they kind of, um, you know, kind of keep themselves guarded over the next couple of years. But I think both sides want each other, mm -hmm. and I think both sides want to get a deal done. And I think a deal does happens. I think a deal does get done. Um, you know, sometime around that July first window. I mean, what what a look for Zion to not really do a whole lot <laughs> right? and be able to get the supermax just oh based off the the few limited flashes that you've shown. It's like. Well, when he's playing, he's, he's worth the yeah. supermax. It's cra it, it's crazy yeah, that he is, is able to negotiate um, like this. And I cannot wait to see them playing with him, like play with him in the lineup God. of what they had on the floor. Because I do kind of buy it's in that from piece. a chemistry standpoint, it probably would have been tough to just throw him into the mix over the last couple of weeks, right? I mean, like for as good as they were playing and as much as they had it figured out, because – one thing was evident. I mean, Brandon Ingram was not this guy with Zion on the floor. No, it was he a wasn't. lot of kind of standing and watching. Zion was at the top. He was running this point forward where he would just kind of clear out and bully everybody to the rim. Now, from the Pelican standpoint, you didn't want to change it because it was working so well. But I mean, from a chemistry standpoint, there wasn't a lot of buy in from the other players, especially a guy like Ingram who has butted into a legitimate superstar. Um, he just ran out of gas. So they need an off season to try and kind of run together, mm -hmm. you know, like figure out how how do you keep the floor spaced well enough with a guy like Ingram who can score, but a guy like Zion who kind of plays like a bull in a china shop. You know what I mean? Where he needs to kind of bounce around, but he's going to get to the rim and he's he's going to finish a hundred percent of the time. But you still got to get Ingram flowing in the game. You got to get these guys moving. You got to get Jonas Valanciunas moving and working. How does he play alongside Zion? Can they, can they play that pick and pop, pick and roll game that Jonas plays very well? Where does Jackson Hayes fit in with a guy like, like Zion? Zion cleans up on the glass, but you need, you need Hayes' athleticism. Does it clog the, play, the, the, the paint up with, with the, that lineup out there? It's just... There's a lot to figure out. And I think you kind of saw maybe what the blueprint is with Zion running the point. Like, he's able to distribute better than people give him credit for. He's a good, he's a willing mm -hmm. and good passer because he attracts so much attention every time he has the basketball. The biggest concern is Alvarado might run him into the ground the way he plays. He's going to, he sprints across the timeline yeah. every, I don't think Zion can really keep up with that, mm -hmm. but we'll see. But I think the Zion running point, being able to distribute the way that he is, you'll see kind of the multifaceted layers to his game that i mean zion's known for kind of one thing it seems with like you know his ability to leap and his dunking ability is what people are attracted to but he can distribute and he's a he's an all-around basketball player that's why he's kind of a if you were to be able to sign a free agent and zion was on the market and he joined the pels you would be ecstatic yeah uh this tweet just coming out from mm -hmm. ian rapaport at <laughs> rap sheet just tweeted three minutes ago the Saints are making a key post-draft addition as they are expected to sign all-pro safety Tyron Matthews, Aww. sources say. A long-awaited signing that should be finalized in the coming days. The Honey Badger lands in a perfect spot. This looks like this is going to get done. Unbelievable. Uh, I mean, oh he's reporting that it is done. It's in uh, ball sack sports, is it? Uh, no, it's not. This is, <laughs> I, I have double-checked this. This is, uh, this is Ian Rappaport's. Um, Real Twitter. Twitter verified blue check at rap sheet <laughs> Twitter account uh, is saying that Tyron Matthew is coming home and going to the New Orleans wow. Saints and a deal is expected to be done over the next couple of days. I Incredible news, that. if true. Um, it oh. sounds like it is true. This also sounds like I mentioned it to, to Lloyd. Um, we had um, reached out and it sounded like this kind of deal had been in place. Um, and where the whole time. not the whole time, but as Nick Underhill explained last week, there was, um, you know, with, with, with a deal like this and the trade that the Saints made pre draft, there was com, um, some compensatory picks that were a, a part of this deal. And to make sure that you maximize those picks, you had to wait until after the draft to strike any free agent deals. So I think that both the Jarvis and Tyron Matthew news if it was real with the Saints, was expected to pop pretty quick after the draft. And just like it was explained to me two weeks ago, 
that if the Matthew deal is real, you'll know within 48 hours of the draft closing. And here we are on Monday morning after the draft closed up shop Saturday night with one of the top reporters in the game, Ian Rappaport, saying that the Saints and Matthew are pretty close to striking a deal, which would be incredible. Incredible. I mean, which <laughs> would, would be, be amazing. Not to mention that you see Matthew play Brady twice a year in conference okay. to see those guys yeah. go back at each other. Uh, if but I you, don't get to that Saints game, I'm going to raise some hell. I'm serious this time. David? <laughs> David? But you imagine, dude, putting Matthew in this locker room. No. Um, that would be amazing. Look, at, look gracious. what Mickey Loomis said on this tweet. This is the this is the the nuts right here. I think it's I think it's happening. <laughs> y'all can guess what they didn't draft a safety. Wow. I Look think y'all Mickey can Loomis, Mickey. I'm telling you, Mickey nuts. This deal's happen. been done. Done. Yeah. This deal's been How done. How come he didn't tell us? <laughs> I don't think they could. I, I, I think mean, that, we had him in the corner How come over he here. We still got a oh, cup Tyron? of water here. No, I don't yeah. think that it was done then. If you remember, it was a week after our conversation that he went to the facility. I think since he went to the facility and had those face to face conversations with Dennis Allen, Mickey Loomis, Losha, the entire Saints organization, and they said, Lushin. look, man, here is, uh, here's the playbook. <laughs> here's how we're going to do it, you know? Um, what, well, and then we had Nick Underhill on who said it was more of like a just a fly-by-night, you know, doing yeah. a, the handshake kind of want to get some gear, and it turns into this meeting was much more than we ever thought it could be. Uh-huh. Does he wear seven? That's what I was just going to ask. I mean, Taysom, Taysom Hill can kick rocks. Taysom Hill would have to give that up. But um, does he have to? Like, how do you do that? Yeah. Did I mean, if you're Tyron, I mean, Tyron's probably got $60 million in the bank. You, you don't have I mean? to even. But I mean, like, sure you do, bro. I know, but how does that I mean, Taysom, work? Taysom, grow up. Understand. Read the room, dude. But what if Boy, you didn't want to give up? it up? <laughs> Taysom <laughs> Hill has, I mean, dude, Taysom Hill has worn seven and has been a respectable seven. And he probably understands that if it came down to it, Tyron Matthew deserves to wear seven in the city of New Orleans much more than he does. Absolutely. But he doesn't have just to gonna, give it up, right? No, he didn't have to give it up. Oh, he would be um, the most hated man in New Orleans. But he understands that yeah. he probably would. But I, I don't think that he's the one that forces the negotiation. I think Matthew comes to him and says, yeah. Taysom, um, we'll make good. buddy, let me know what you want. You know what I mean? Money is no object. I can make anything, just about anything you really want happen for you. I'm signed by Jordan. I mean, the all-star jumpsuit that he wore in this interview with the honey badger and, and, the, and the signature on the Jordan jumpsuit with the all-star Jays on. I mean, if I'm Taysom, I just say, you know I mean? Throw me 100K <laughs> in that fit right there, T, and we'll call it a day. I don't know. I think I'd ask for more than that. I mean, <laughs> look, unbelievable. Taysom's making just money, too. Give it to yeah. Yeah, he's got the but weirdest contract. Kind of he's got the weirdest contract in the NFL. All of the... <laughs> You know, all that money is Fugazi. Put it on the poll. What are you giving up? If you're, what are you asking for if you're Taysom Hill for seven? Jeez. What's the negotiation? His penis. Half a million. His penis. <laughs> we haven't seen Taysom's though, so That's we don't true. really know. That's and an he's unfair. We've seen ties. Yeah. We, yeah, we <laughs> have. There's an ace. <laughs> oh, my God. Good Lord. Lord. Uh, all right, we're going to talk to Garrett Nussmeyer coming up here shortly. We're also going to talk to Greg Brooks. Uh, we have, uh, we've been at this thing for an, uh, for... Uh, an hour and 27 minutes straight. Let us break for a little bit. We'll be right back and have more of the Jordy Collada Show brought to you, as always, by City Cafe. Check out our friends at citycafebr.net, citycafebr.net. Lunch specials every single day, Monday through Friday. Stop and see them on O'Neill and George O'Neill, where they've been in business for over 100 years. Check our friends out over there, Cody, Dirk, Squeaky, and the crew. They got fresh crawfish. They got oysters, whether you're tra- uh, char-grilled, uh, or whether you want raw oysters, they got them for you over at City Cafe. CityCafeBR.net online, or stop in and see them at O'Neill and George O'Neill, uh, located off of uh, off of I-12. We'll be back with more of the Jordy Collada Show, driven and powered by Go Chevrolet. Let's go, Tyron. God, you scared me. <laughs> Red Stick Sports, a local staple in Baton Rouge to all sports fans, was founded back in 1981 and has remained a family business for over 40 years. Today, they still have the great selection on the floor, but they're also a leader in custom apparel for businesses, sports teams, and other groups. Take it from us, everybody over here at FM Digital Media. They help us out with all of our apparel. Let them help you out today. Go ask for Cody over at Red Stick Sports. Check him out online at redsticksports.biz.
Southern Eye Centers, located at 6859 Jefferson Highway, right here in Baton Rouge, has been serving your eyes for over 40 years in the Capital Region. They offer friendly service in a helpful environment with the highest level of personal care to manage your eye health and vision needs. If you want more information, log online to southerneyecenters.com. That is southerneyecenters.com. Stop in and check out their beautiful office located on Jefferson Highway right here in the capital city. And remember, each time you walk in there and you mention the Jordy Collada Show, Dr. Ann Shaw and Southern Eye Centers will take 25% off of their fantastic selection of sunglasses. All you got to do is mention the Jordy Collada Show. Check them out, southerneyecenters.com and located at 6859 Jefferson Highway. Hey, y'all, it's Mikey from Miked Up. Catch us live every Monday and Wednesday, 11 to 1. Talk gambling, talk sports, have a ton of guests in here, get a little perspective from the athlete side of it. We got Lloyd in the house, Jay Mitch is in here a lot of the time. It's a fun show, great show. Please like, subscribe, share with your friends. If you don't like it, it's fine. Make fun of us, it's okay. Just get us out there, show, share us out there. We having fun, we want to share our fun with you. Like I said, Miked Up brought to you by Sterling Automotive every Monday through Wednesday, 11 to 1. Catch us live on YouTube, baby. See ya. Looking to book a dumpster but no idea how? We've made it quick and easy for you. Check out our website at moralesrolloffs.com. Let Morales Rolloffs know your desired delivery date and finally, provide your contact details. To make payment, look out for an email invoice with all your booking details. On delivery day, our driver will notify you through text and email that your dumpster is ready and on the way. Now you know how easy and convenient it is. Call Morales Roloffs at 225-427-0000 for your dumpster. All right, seems like this is a, uh, a done deal for Tyron Matthew. The Badger landed in New Orleans. The NFL is reporting that uh, they are expected, the Saints are expected to sign safety Tyron Matthew as it is breaking news. Tyron Matthew, Nick Underhill uh, just uh, tweeted out one minute ago. Might be a day or two <laughs> before Penn officially hits paper, but should be done this week as uh, Underhill, who is a uh, New Orleans Saints insider, uh, and the uh, the Badger uh, coming home as uh, Tyron Matthew is uh, officially a New Orleans Saint. What a press conference that will be Good to have Lord. him introduced. Uh, <laughs> Mark's going to in have his, to paint him uh, in half the Saints uniform, oh, just like our Joe Burrow. Right? Yeah. we got to add that. Do you, put, gold, man. do you put the Badger guarding Jamar Chase in the watch room? Ooh. Oof. That would be cool. That would be good. It would be good. Let's go. This is exciting. It, it is. is exciting. It's crazy. Which is, I guess, the best signing since Drew Brees, probably, for the Saints. Um, I don't even know if you knew what you were getting in Brees when you signed him. Um, so from a a city feel, from a sentimental feel, I don't know if this is comparable. I don't know. I can't think of a player that Seems has too been good to be true. Yeah, locally, does. especially with playing time left. I mean, usually when you see these time mean, now, I know that this is later in Ty's career, but Ty is still playing at a all pro pro bowl type level 29. at the safety position. I think he just turned 30. Um, so it is going to be, uh, it's going to be wild to see the reaction to this it man. It's going to be wild. Saints are, I mean, Saints are built to win. Yeah. Jarvis too. Maybe. Bring him up. Odell. Why maybe. not? Yeah. Maybe so. Get the band Bring back together. Stewie. <laughs> Stewie. Um, good Noah? news, good news. Tyra Matthew, New Orleans Saints, striking a deal as uh, they were coming it's, home. If you could pick one former LSU player to come and play for the Saints, this is the this, this is, is the lotto, yes. huh? This is the pick. Leonard, Ty? Leonard Leonard's up there. Um, Pat Matthews there. I'd love to see Jamar Chase. 
I don't know. Y'all would have been. Yeah. What if Joe Burrow went there though? Yeah, that, that would have well, been. Remember when they thought? Remember we thought we'd get jo, you'd get <laughs> Joe Burrow in like the fourth or fifth round after <laughs> yeah, 2018. You're like, oh, the, the, the predecessor or the 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 up and comer after Drew Brees. This makes so much sense. <laughs> Actually, I'm gonna go first overall, win the Heisman, go to Cincinnati, bring to the Super Bowl. Okay, Brees a little high and inside on his opening pitch on his pitch yesterday. Oh, I didn't uh, see at it. The box. Was it a little heat? Uh, yeah, he went full wind up. Um, he did. I saw the still photographs of it. How I was many, like, Damn. Dude, how many times do you think you practiced that? You know, knowing that Drew Brees, thing. he was definitely repping in the backyard He's with all of his you. sons. Yeah, for sure. Not his daughter. Doesn't throw her anything. But loves what? to play with his. How do you know? Because every video he puts out, he's only thrown to his, his sons. Oh, really? And the daughter's just like, eh, like <laughs> I mean, I'm sure the here. daughter in that family is just whatever she wants, she gets. Absolutely. Right. She's like, the youngest. I mean, we got a hundred million in the get, bank. Well, yeah, no love, but yeah, you get anything you want. <laughs> I just think don't she's like fine. you that much. Yeah. I think she's fine. Probably. Uh, <laughs> you and Brittany go hang out. But <laughs> I'm with Brayden. Breeze was. Uh, he gave the the pregame speech to the boys yesterday for LSU baseball. Breeze is now one and zero in that one, but gave the same kind of New Orleans Saints themed pregame speech that he would given for so many years as the New Orleans Saints leader, and then he gets out there. And throws a, uh, a a first pitch that, uh, yeah, I mean he was in it. He was he was definitely in it. There's but, one thing that I can guarantee uh, he would be yeah he'd high be and into tight. it yeah high and tight. <laughs> Look good in the, in, in the golds though. They said uh, Mikey was saying that Odell threw out the best first pitch he's ever seen. I think he was like touched up her 80s and wow. just fucking brought that brought heat. And the catcher was like, what? Whoa, dude! I was not ready for that. Yeah. Luckily, I'm an athlete back here. But Odell rocked and fired. Did y'all see that Tennessee pitcher? 105 miles, 105 miles an hour. Isn't Already that, had like Tommy the record, John, right? That's um, crazy. He, he touches 103 every time he fucking picks up the baseball. Well, I think That's he scary. hit 104 like mm -hmm. eight times. And he's he's already had Tommy John, so this is gonna you know he's just got a rocket arm. Uh, it's the last Mister Fantastic wrist. It's just yeah, the last of wild. Good. Jesus, they're very good. Yeah, they're gonna win. The whole thing. Uh, yeah, they're yeah good. they are. Yeah. They're gonna win. The tell is the guy. I'm telling you. We tried is. to tell you. Everybody banged, <laughs> everybody banged on us when we were beating yeah, the Patello drum. I'm telling y'all. I mean, the guy is. I Nails. mean, I love Jay Johnson. I mean, I'm not saying. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, but yeah, just yeah, but we were everybody that was. I mean, hating on Vitello. Look at that squad, man. I mean, professional remember the baseball. pictures? Like, remember we were like tracking the plane, like tracking him, like pictures of him here to with Arkansas. the in Baton Rouge. It was crazy. Weren't was it? He didn't he visit? Baton Rouge? Yeah, well, yeah. Well, we thought he did, right? Yeah. What is that? Allegedly. We were trying to break down that photo the of photo. him. It seemed like he was on LSU's campus. Yeah. We're like, oh, it's getting done. I think he did, you right? Know? He visited. Uh, it's easy to say. We still don't think know. that was true. Um, Flying the Italian who flags. Yeah. You two yeah. chest bumping each other. Uh, yeah. Katie, tell us about what's going on over at Dead Soxy. Dead Soxy's doing a Mother's Day deal, y'all. Y'all know Mother's Day is Sunday. Yes. Lest oh, we forget. Yes. Uh, they're still doing their 35% off sale with the code Jordy. But for Mother's Day, you get a mystery box, and it's 20 pairs of the no-show socks for $70 with the code Jordy. 20 pair. And you love the no-shows, wow. right? Love the no -shows. I love the no-shows. You love the no-shows. No that's right. That's right. So 20 pair, $70, use the code Jordy. And then you can also still put the code Jordy in and get 35% off of everything else site-wide. Site Deadsoxy.com. Dead, S-O-X-Y.com. Nothing disappears like a pair uh, of socks. Deadsoxy.com. Thank you very much. Um, all right. We will be back with uh, Garrett Nussmeyer is here. The we bus. are uh, We are not on the Nuss bus. We are driving the <laughs> Nuss bus over here at the Jordy Collada Show. Our guy is inside the studio. We'll ask him about the offseason, what the expectation is coming out of the competition in spring, um, and just what it's like now in Brian Kelly's offense and Mike Denbrock's offense and some of the weapons uh, that he will have access to coming up uh, throughout the off season and going into fall camp. Uh, one of the uh, one of the fierce, fiercest competitions on the uh, on the football field is at the quarterback of position. All time. Uh, mm -hmm. We will talk to Garrett Nussmeyer coming up next here on the Jordy Collada Show, driven and powered by Go Chevrolet.
Southern Eye Centers, where their passion is caring for eyes. It's what they do. They've been doing it for 40 years. They've been offering the Capital Region a friendly, helpful environment with the highest level of personal care to manage your eye health and vision needs. Stop in and see their brand new office on Jefferson Highway today, where you can find them at 6859 Jefferson Highway. They also are the daily poll sponsor on the Colada Show. And remember, if you go into Southern Eye Center of Baton Rouge and you mention the Jordy Colada Show, you will receive 25% off of their fantastic sunglasses selection over at Southern Eye Center. Check out Dr. Ann Shaw and Southern Eye Center, the daily poll sponsor of the Jordy Colada Show. Red Stick Sports, a local staple in Baton Rouge to all sports fans, was founded back in 1981 and has remained a family business for over 40 years. Today, they still have the great selection on the floor, but they're also a leader in custom apparel for businesses, sports teams, and other groups. Take it from us, everybody over here at FM Digital Media. They help us out with all of our apparel. Let them help you out today. Go ask for Cody over at Red Stick Sports. Check him out online at redsticksports.biz. <laughs> All right, welcome back here to the Jordy Colada Show, driven and powered by Go Chevrolet here on this Monday. Make sure and give us a like, share, comment. If you have not already subscribed to the YouTube channel, make sure and hit that subscription button. Looking forward to our next interview, man. Uh, it has been a crazy and wild ride for our guy, Garrett Nussmeyer, since he's landed in Baton Rouge. Played a couple of games last year, got the experience, ended up keeping the red shirt, and now going into his sophomore season, or his red shirt freshman season, uh, in the midst of a very fierce competition. Uh, coming out of spring, one that uh, was fun to watch over the last couple of weeks and now heading into the offseason. We've got a chance to sit down with our guy Garrett Nussmeyer right here in studio, and he's joining us on the Jordy Colada Show. Good morning, man. Thank you for your time. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, we talked to you a lot during the recruiting process uh, before you got to Baton Rouge, uh, and obviously since you've been on campuses, uh, uh, since you've been on campus, life has been uh, wild with school and football. Uh, what has your college experience been like, first and foremost? No, I mean it's been it's been everything I've dreamed of. Uh, you know, I've always wanted to. You know, growing up, like watching my dad's players, it's like kind of living out the dream. Uh, so, I mean, it's been exciting to say the least. You know, with everything going on, and uh, you know, especially at LSU. So, I mean, have what, fun. What was your biggest takeaway from last year, both mentally and physically? Um, biggest takeaway, I guess. Uh, I learned a lot. You know, I mean, it was very eventful for me. Yeah. Um, but. I mean, man, I mean, it's tough to say that I learned, like, one biggest thing. You know, I learned a lot. Um, it was kind of almost hectic, I guess you could say, with everything going on. Uh, it was a heck of a first year, uh, just, you know, with the whole Coach O situation. And, uh, you know, I got a new coach and all this stuff going on. And, John know. Trey beat you out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 shout out Chu. Uh, but, uh, no, that was that was fun, you know, helping getting him ready to play. Um, it was definitely interesting, but. I mean, I guess the biggest lesson that I learned from it was kind of like you never know what's going to hit you. Um, I think it was a huge, like, experience for me as a freshman to, like, go through so much. It's like almost like now w what else can happen, you know? Like, yeah. I've been through so much as a freshman. Like, it was huge to get to learn all those lessons. So, How fast was the SEC compared to where you were? You played big-time high school football yeah. in Texas. I mean, I don't think that it was how, – how, how different is the game? Um, I mean, it's hard to say that um, – it was a huge like turnover for me because, like you said, you know Texas is such a high level of play. It's almost yeah. like playing small level D one football, especially at the six A level uh, in Texas. So, I mean, it's almost like, I mean, I'm, in high school I practiced at five a.m. You know, um, so it's not like the workload was a huge change for me uh, going into um, LSU, but like obviously you know you're playing in the SEC, so yeah. it's it's a different animal for sure. So. Um, I mean, I thought it was it was it was a challenge that I enjoyed. You know, I didn't run from it. Like I, I liked that, so it was a lot of fun. Um, I I, I know you, the type of competitor you are. 
Have you ever thought about transfer? Have you ever thought of that? No, nah, I mean, that's never came to my mind. Um, LSU is where I want to be. You know, I've said it before, like, Louisiana is my home. Uh, you no, know, I want to do whatever it takes to be the guy here. Um, and so, you know, just put your head down and I just keep working. So, what did you make? You got a lot of people that day. April 1st, you seemed to hit full a couple of people. <laughs> I, I woke up and I see my phone. I'm like, wait, am, am I transferring? Like, Dang, this is news to me too. So, what did I do last night? Yeah, I, I don't remember that. So. Fucking Bash. <laughs> it's all Bash's fault. No everything, doubt about it. Everything's Jack's fault. I agree. Blame Jack. 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 the next head coach. Yeah. Uh, just follow him on Twitter. Yeah. Um, Unbelievable. Brian Kelly, when did you first hear his name? What did you think of him when he was announced? And how's your relationship with the head coach? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I was kind of thrown off. Like, I didn't know that yeah, that was even possible, you know, with Coach Kelly. Um, Coach Woodworth, or, or Mr. Woodworth, I guess, uh, Mr. Scott Woodworth, he's awesome, you know. And so, like, I knew we were in good hands. Like, you know, I knew Mr. Scott was going to get us a guy, get us the right guy. Um, I've known him since I was a little kid. Uh, he was AD at Washington. My dad was at the University of Washington, so I've known him for a while. Uh, so, I mean, I felt good throughout the process. I was like, you know, he's he's going to find the right guy. And, you know, I think the fan base respects him a lot. You know, he yeah. – I mean, he knows what he's doing. Uh, so, I mean, I trusted him. And uh, when we hired Coach Kelly, I, I was pretty excited. Um, you know, I didn't really know what was going to go on at first just because, you know, I didn't know how we were going to do offensively, um, what we were going to do, what was going to be the scheme, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, Coach Denbrock and, and the guys they brought in, Coach Sloan, um, you know, I, I love them. I love my coaches. Uh, I think they do a really, really good job. Uh, so, I mean, I'm super excited. And, Coach Kelly, it's awesome because he's so hands-on. It's like, you know, it's not only like if I throw a bad ball, like it's not just Coach Sloan in my ear. It's like, what? Like Coach Kelly's <laughs> like, what? And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, and getting to learn from him and, and like know what your head coach wants you to do is so big. Like you have such a strong structure of, hey, this is what my head coach wants from me as a starting quarterback. And um, I think that's huge. So. Did, did Notre Dame recruit you out of high school? Nah, so, I mean, that, Notre Dame is different in their recruiting. Like they – they had a kid committed uh, uh -huh. since freshman year, and that's uh, – I think it was, like, Tyler Bushner. That's his, that's my guy. Uh, he's a stud. But, yeah. I mean, they had him committed since, like, sophomore – early sophomore year, so they were out of the game fast. Um, what do you make of this competition? I, I, I call this the fiercest competition on the team, it feels like, and just watching you guys. But you, Miles Brennan, who is the older guy who has the experience, and then Walker Howard throws his name into the mix as the number one quarterback in last year's recruiting cycle, and then a transfer in in Jaden Daniels, and you kind of the guy who has has been there for a year. Um, somebody that is in this competition, what do you make of it? Um, I mean, it's been interesting. I mean, it's, it's hard to get, um, you know, three guys reps and, and, like, you know, kind of split that up, but uh, – you just have to learn to like when it's your turn to go. Like you can't worry about anything else. You know, it's just, it doesn't matter what anybody else does. It matters what you do and how you play, how you compete. Um, and I, mean, I think it's just like anything in life. You know, if you want something, you're gonna do whatever it takes to get it. Um, and you know, I think the biggest part for me this spring was just it's all internal. You know, um, and if you get lost in like looking around and what's going on, and oh, that was a great throw by Jaden or Miles is balling like. You can't root against them. I'll never root against uh, any other the quarterbacks in the room because that doesn't do anything because it's all about, like, what am I going to do, you know? If I root against Miles while he's up and then I go up and I suck, then I'm worried about somebody else. Now I suck, you know? It doesn't matter. And I can play the guy that sucks. Um, so, you know, you root for them to do great and you root, you work on yourself to try and do great with your reps. And I think that's the biggest thing in a QB competition is just literally just you have to focus on yourself. You can't get lost and – all the talk about a competition and who's going to play, who's going to start, it doesn't really matter if you're not playing to the level to where you can be the guy. So, Is the responsibility of the position different from last season or polarizingly different than what it was last season? Um, I mean, I think at any time, you know, being the quarterback, you have a huge responsibility. Uh, you know, you got to lead the offense. I think one thing Coach Sloan talks about a lot, which I like, is – you know, being the quarterback, you control the rhythm of the offense um, and how fast we go, how slow do we go, you know, controlling it, slowing it down, being the leader and, and really being the, the guy that everybody looks at. You know, when, when offense is struggling and going slow, who does everybody look at, right? It's the quarterback. What is he doing? What's taking him so long, you know? Uh, so you got to have control of that. You got to slow it down or you got to speed it up when you're going fast, you know? So I think that was a big thing. How's the relationship with Denbrock? How do you like what you learned from him over the last couple of months? Yeah, Coach Denbrock's awesome. Um, I love his personality. I think that's the coolest part is, you know, he'll, he'll get on you quick. Um, but he also is like, 
out of, outside of practice, like he'll make a couple jokes and like those are my type of people to be yeah. honest. Like I like to be able to mess around with my coaches and like everybody is like that. It seems like you know, Coach Denbrock, Coach Sloan, even Coach Kelly is like cool to hang out with. Like it's kind of weird to think about, but like I would like hang out, you know what I'm saying, and like right. mess around with them in in the office upstairs, you know, outside of meetings and practice. Uh, but I mean, Coach Denbrock's awesome. I think he does a really great job. So I'm I'm very excited. Give us a play him. call, real quick. Give us a play call. One, three, two. One, oh my go. God! Uh, uh, dang, you know how many play calls there are? <laughs> uh, trio right, Nola hot, extra. I don't know. That's just throwing stuff out there. And I mean, it's definitely longer than what we what we had last year. I mean, like we have some pretty long play calls now. Um, which I think it took a, a lot of us a minute to kind of like fully get going with this offense because, I mean, before things were a lot shorter. Now we kind of like makes sense like tag individual things like you know it could be like x smoke or you know like z betsy like it, it just like is more individual so put it all together and it looks longer and it looks scary but like when you go through it it's like okay it's easy you know everybody knows what they're doing because of the play call no are we checking yeah. with me still or what are we doing uh i mean like everybody checks with me a little bit so i mean i'm sure we'll have that as a tempo um but you know last year i think we did a lot of that um I mean, I think it, That's it, one way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it was, it was, it worked and then it didn't work. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's hard because in the SEC nowadays, like defenses are smart, you know, like even with like RPOs, like they'll mess with you. Like they know you're reading that guy to try and throw a glance behind him. Like they're going to come up and then somebody's going to be right there. You to throw it right to him, you know? Um, I mean, the game's evolving like every week. So like, Every year, something's different. Like, who knows what's going to happen this year? Like, defense is probably going to come with some crazy way to stop everything this year or something, you know? But, um, I mean, the check-in with me, I, I kind of like it sometimes, but I also like to just go and just play. So. Yeah. Um, you don't like the gunslinger stuff. I don't nah. think that – but you're not – that's not who you are. Like, nah. did you have that reputation in high school? No. I think it was just because – I like to take a couple chances maybe every once yeah. now and then. I'm, I mean, I'm not afraid to throw the ball down the field. Um, so I guess, I don't know, maybe as a true freshman I came in and maybe I was looking for the deep ball too much and that maybe that's where that kind of came in. But my whole life my best quality has been that, like, I run the offense. You know, I'm, I'm very good at I'm, I'm I'm intellectual. I can tell people where they're supposed to be, get the tempo right, like get us going, um, make the right reads. So... I'm gonna show that this year, hopefully. So, For sure. you know, kind of get rid of that little gunslinger thing, and maybe more of a game manager mindset will, will come out. So, um, the number's always been 13, right? You wanted to get back to 13. Was that the number? That was the idea the entire time. Yes, sir. So my pops wore 13. Yeah. He actually played for the Saints and wore 13. Uh, so my whole life, I wore 13. Um, I wasn't able to wear it last year because of Chew, you know, the guy that beat me out. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> nah. um, but so, I mean, I talked to Chu. I was like, hey, so you're going to let me wear that next year? And he's like, yeah. So, I mean, I've been in 13 all off season. So, no, I didn't get my number stolen. Um, I, I was excited that I got to wear 13 again. So, yeah. Um, what is your relationship like with your dad as a football coach? I, I, I'm not trying to get into your personal dad son <laughs> relationship, good, good. but as a as a football <laughs> player, on how, boy. <laughs> how is how does that work? How, how does how do you guys go back and forth? Um, I mean, it's pretty cool. Like yeah. you know, um, I don't know. Like it's it's hard to explain. It's like um, it's like having another coach. Like. You know, you always got to listen to what your coach says, right? And, like, mm -hmm. my dad's always told me, well, it doesn't matter what I say. It matters what your coach is telling you to do. Um, but it's definitely cool to, like, have that. You know, and, and football concepts are universal. So, like, if I'm like, hey, Dad, we got this drive concept. He's like, okay, explain to me your read. I'm like, boom, 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 boom. And then I did this, this, and I missed it here. And he's like, oh, well, I'm sure your coach would tell you you should have went here <laughs> and you missed this. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's where I missed. And so it's cool to have, like, another another person to check with. And um, one thing I will say is my dad has never, ever been the type, you know, growing up. He's never once called a coach about my playing time. He's never once got involved with any of that. Um, even last year, he has never once been the guy to, why aren't you playing my son? Why is my son not in the game? Why is my son not playing? Uh, that's never been him. He's never done that my whole life. Um, he didn't even do that last year. So, I mean, there was a lot of stories about that, but yeah. that, that wasn't true. So, yeah. yeah that. Um, what are your relationship like with his players? I'd imagine that like a guy like Dak, do you, um, do, I mean, yeah. do you access him? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I've talked to him a couple of times. Um, I actually, you know, before COVID it was pretty cool. I would be on the sideline every game. 
uh, my job was to hold the iPad. Uh, so got put to work, um, which was a lot of fun. I mean, I got to experience a lot <laughs> yeah, of cool stuff. I bet. Uh, but, I mean, they're always great. I mean, I've never really been in an experience where uh, players treated me very poorly, and especially yeah. in Dallas. Like, those guys are awesome. Uh, you know, Zeke and Dak and Coop actually played for my dad at Alabama um, and then was with them last year. So, yeah. so and casual. I, I heard him, sp- and I heard him and speak Coop. over the weekend, <laughs> and you could tell that Coop didn't want to leave Dallas. Um, like you I'm could, sure he yeah, did. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, hey, I mean, it's a business. You know, the sure. NFL, it's, it's wild. So, yeah. Um, what is your – emphasis this off season um i mean one thing with me i'm always working on getting bigger um you know i was let's see 172 when i first got to school um but that was fresh off a of hand surgery um and you know i got all the way up to like 190 before the season um and then you know of course you're gonna lose a little bit of weight during the season so I'm, i mean i'm at like 187 right now uh so just continuing to like keep getting bigger there you know my goal is to be about 200 190 before the season uh which is very realistic i think for me because I, I can put the weight on decently quick, um, you know, when I'm really, really working out and we're really lifting. Um, if you need advice, just talk to Miles. He seems to have found out yeah. the secret. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll ask Miles a couple of questions about that. But um, I think the biggest thing for me was kind of slowing down the game and just letting my processing work, um, just seeing smaller things. Uh, one thing Coach Sloan has worked on me the most with is, like, being results, uh, being not result, like, oriented and being more process oriented. Um, I think sometimes I'll be like, I may like skip past a read and, and throw a 60 yard touchdown. It's like, oh, let's go through 60 yard touchdown. But it's like, hey, you would have thrown a 60 yard touchdown to this guy. And this is your right read. So hmm. throw it to this guy instead of because that guy fell down. And so he's only open because of this. He's like, I get you throw a 60 yard touchdown. But if you throw it to the guy you're supposed to, that's going to work 10 out of 10 times. And this is going to work eight out of 10 times. So I think for me, that's kind of been something I've been working on is like, hey, stick with this, like, yeah, he's wide open because that guy fell, but, you know, obviously in a game, if a dude falls and the dude's wide open, I'm going to throw it to him. (laughs) Pull the trigger. (laughs) But, but like, I'm trying to change my process as to because that guy's not going to fall down every play. You know what I'm saying? So it's like if my process is, hey, start here, then the one time where the dude does fall down, if I've thrown this nine out of ten times and I'm nine for ten right now, oh, he does fall down, okay, now I can throw the touchdown, you know. But as long as I'm going through the – the process the right way. I think that's the biggest thing for me. Absolutely. Um, you've got weapons everywhere. It oh, feels yeah. like and oh, when yeah. you look at oh, your, yeah. the overall units of LSU football, defensive line jumps out as a very talented group. And then your eyeballs go Mason to wide Smith receiver. Sucks, yeah, Mason Smith. That's right. No good. Looks yeah, like a punt returner. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the, 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 the wide receivers, it feels like they're dripping off of trees over there. Yeah. Um, as a quarterback, what do you, what do you see when you see that position? That's awesome. Um, I mean, how can I complain? You know, mm-hmm. like, I throw the ball, I mean, something goes bad, throw it up to Malik Neighbors, throw it up to Jack Bash, throw it up to Brian Thomas, you know. You still got Kayshawn Butte waiting. I mean, Kayshawn's coming back. He's still hurt. Like, it's it's actually pretty scary if you think about um, if we can have a quarterback that's playing at a high level, no matter who it is, with the weapons that we have. And I think the O-line group is coming together very well. Um, I think some people gave him some crap after the spring game because we took a couple sacks, but – I want y'all to realize who they had to block, like mm-hmm. Ali Gay, Mason Smith, Jaquelin Roy, uh, Makai Wingo, like come BJ on now. yeah, BJ, like, <laughs> dude, these these guys aren't scrubs. Yeah. Like, that's probably the best defensive line group in the country. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Right. like dudes that could all be Hall of Famers. Yeah. Like, um, I mean, and Coach uh, Coach Davis does an unbelievable job. I love Coach Davis. Uh, I mean, ever since he's got here, he's just been like awesome. Um, he brings just so much energy and so much juice to that group, and, like, they feed off it, and they love it. I mean, I think at first they didn't really like it just because, like, he came in here, let's go, let's go, and they're like, whoa, hold on, who are you, you know? And then, like, they got to know him, and they're like, oh, crap, like, I love this guy. Yeah. And um, Coach Davis is awesome. I think everybody loves Coach Davis just because, you know, he's always energetic and always, you know, getting on everybody's tail. And so, I mean, I think it helps the whole line a lot, and I think they do a great job, so. Um. I, you mentioned B.J. Ojolari, and the, the, one of the great pieces of video that came out of spring was you shaking up B.J. On a, <laughs> on, a, on a run and kind of talking shit to him a little bit on the way yeah. back. How much emphasis is that on the quarterback this year to be able to make plays with your feet? Um, I mean, I, I don't know that it's going to be massive and huge, and I don't know that we're going to be like Tim Tebow's, but uh, <laughs> right. I think uh, Coach Denbrock likes to use the, use the quarterback a little bit um, as far as like zone reads and, and – uh, 
I don't think Coach Stenbrock is the type to – I mean, I think he knows what the SEC is. I don't think he's going to be telling us to run straight into defensive line in the SEC. You know, everything we do is off of a read to where we're running one-on-one -on -one with somebody. You know, it's like – if he goes there, okay, now pull it. You're running one on one with the safety. You know, like he's not trying to get us killed. He's he's using us as a weapon, which I really like. Uh, and I mean, I I I like to run a little bit. I mean, I've I've ran before, um, so like I like to be able to, you know, if I pull the ball and go run for a first down and get down. Like I think that's something that'll that'll be really good for us. Um, Greg Brooks just walked into the studio, and he'll be coming up here next on on the show. Um, you guys put a ton of transfers into the locker room. A lot of new faces. Yeah. Um, somebody that was there last year during that transition. How has that gone? Um, I mean, it was definitely interesting. You got all these new guys coming in, uh, but they've all been great. Uh, they've all, like, you know, adapted pretty well to the to the locker room, which is cool because, you know, sometimes you'd be like, all these new guys coming in, they're going to be hot-headed and think they run stuff and, like, try and do their own thing. But, no, nah, I mean, like, they've all been awesome. It's pretty cool to see, like, they've all came in and you know, we're all boys. So, I mean, you know how it is in a locker room. Everybody's Everybody's boys, so... Uh, I mean, everybody just about that's came in has been like so cool that I've talked to and, you know, I've, I've got to know most of them. And so, I mean, like, I'm, I'm glad they're here for sure. So, yeah. um, true freshman standpoint, anybody stand out? Some of these new, these, these new guys, I know Will Campbell seems Will like he's Campbell, in the, yeah, that, right. that kid's a freak. Um, I mean, especially like offensive lineman is like the one position that it's like, what are the odds that this kid plays as a true freshman? Like, and Will came in and it's like. Like, I mean, the kid's supposed to be going to prom, you right. know, like, and he's right. balling in the SEC. <laughs> right. And like I said, against B.J. Ujulari, Mason Smith, like, that's pretty impressive. So, like, I mean, that makes me feel good knowing I got him for three years. Right. So, um, yeah, he, he's a stud. I, I know he kind of outside of the competition right now, just as a true freshman, it seems like you guys from an experience standpoint are really duking it out. But what have you made of Walker, Howard? Walk, Walker's going to be a stud. Um Walker's gonna be a stud. I mean, he's great. Uh, I love, I love his mindset. And I love, like, I, I love Walker. Howard. Walker is awesome. Um, it's just like he, he's cool. He's, he's always down to do what's best for the team. You know, um, I mean, it's hard. You know, being a true freshman. It's kind of like where I was at last year. I mean, it was four of us. Um, it wasn't as heated, and it wasn't necessarily as as big of a competition. Um, but you know, I, there were times where I didn't get as many reps as I would have liked, and. Uh, you know, same thing kind of happens to Walker, just being a true freshman. That's just how it is. And, like, he never once was over there pouting about it or making us feel bad about it. Like, he's supporting us. And I, I just I respect him a lot for that because, um, I mean, I went through the same thing and I had to do the same thing, you know. Um, so, I mean, he, he's going to be an absolute stud. So, um, One more on personnel from a coaching standpoint. Tommy Moffitt was a staple of LSU. I mean, he was almost the face of not only the football program, but like the institution yeah. uh, for the last 20 years. Huge turnover from the strength department. I know how much that means to a football program. What's been the transition to Coach Flint? Um, I think the, di the biggest difference um, that, that we've kind of like gone to is, you know, before it was kind of like a heavier woke workload and it's like, you know, conditioning was just like tough it out, let's go, be tough. Um, and I mean, that still is how it is, you know, it's not easy at all. I mean, it's it's hard, it's hard stuff that we do, but like a, a typical day of running for us is like, we'll bring the lasers out and um, it's not seven times run through the laser. It's, we do our warm up, we get loose, we get right. And it's like, hey, two full speed sprints through this thing, full maximum effort. I want your best time. And it's like, it helps because it's not just like getting us tired and giving us bad numbers, like it's, you're, you're at full go, you're running full speed through the laser, and then, like, you're tracking your times over the weeks. So as we lift, as we keep going, like, you can see your numbers rising. And it, it's, like, it shows you not only are they like, hey, you're getting better. It's like, hey, look, you're getting better. Like, your times are going up because we're doing this and blah, 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 blah. And I think that helps, like, for some people that, like, aren't necessarily, like, man, I love this weight room stuff. Or it's like if you see progress, it makes you want to keep doing that because you trust it, you know. So... I think Coach Flynn and the staff do a great job. So SWAT team captain yet? Not yet, not yet. We're we're still we're still getting there. So um, any I think gold jersey times? Points. Oh yeah, we got the gold jersey a couple times. Don't worry about that. So, <laughs> uh, yep. Uh, Garrett Nussmeyer, uh, LSU quarterback. Competition is fierce going into the off season. It would be fun to watch this group develop as they come in to fall camp. Opener against Florida State in the Superdome. It'll be fun to see 
how this team gets uh, prepared there. We'll, we'll talk to one of the defensive leaders, Greg Brooks. We mentioned that transfer portal LSU was having a ton of success. One of the big names that popped early on was Greg Brooks. Explain his game real quick before we get him in here. Stud. Stud. That's it. He's yeah. a baller. So. Uh, it's good to see you, Nuss. He picked you off ever? Me. Absolutely. Huh? He gets you a practice ever? Never that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing. Uh, good to see you, man. Good <laughs> yes, luck. Yes, sir. We'll Thanks for you having soon. me. Yeah, Garrett Nussmeyer, yes, LSU quarterback, in with us here on the Jordy Collada Show. When we come back, uh, one of the defensive leaders, Greg Brooks, stopping in studio here. Remember, Jordy Collada Show brought to you by GoFlow IV, our friends over at GoFlow IV, located on Jefferson Highway. Use the promo code Jordy and you'll receive 15% off of your initial visit over there. G E A U X Flow IV.com. Go Flow IV.com on Jefferson Highway. We're back with Greg Brooks right here on the Jordy Collada Show. All right, personal testimony from my trip over to Johnson and Spillers. Shout out to my friend, Dr. Chad Spillers, for taking care of me, man. I had to have my front tooth or tooth implanted, my front tooth, and it was a hell of an ordeal, but Dr. Spillers and the crew from Johnson and Spillers made it as easy and seamless as possible to work with, and have taken the uh, final product, and it is absolutely beautiful. Learn more online at johnsonspillers.com. Whether you're looking for Botox or you need help in any type of dentistry, whether it is dentures, night guards, if you're looking for Invisalign, if you're interested in implant dentistry like I got, you can get in touch with Johnson and Spillers. Online, johnsonspillers.com. Two locations, one in Gonzales, one in Baton Rouge. Easiest way to get them, online at johnsonspillers.com. All right, welcome back here to the Jordy Collada Show. Good stuff with Garrett Nussmeyer here as we keep the conversation rolling with one of the leaders from LSU's football team, a huge offseason pickup. By the way, Damone Clark coming in studio 1 o'clock today here. As soon as we wrap up the Mikey Matuk Show, switch back over to the Jordy Collada YouTube station. We will talk to Damone Clark, one of the leaders of LSU football, drafted by the Dallas Cowboys over the weekend, had the spinal surgery in the offseason, but, uh, but looks like uh, is still on pace uh, for his NFL career. Uh, so we go from Garrett Nussmeyer. We've got Damone Clark coming up at 1 o'clock and really been looking forward to our conversation with Greg Brooks, who is a West Jeff native, a Louisiana native, has been off at Arkansas for the past couple of years where he was a three-year starter in the secondary for the Hogs, but a huge pickup, as we said, for, uh, for Coach, uh, Coach House, Coach Kelly, and the crew. And we welcome Greg Brooks here to the studio of the Jordy Collada Show. Great to see you, man. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate you having me. Absolutely. Um, we just talked to Nuss Meyer and just talked to him about some of the spring competition that's going on. But from your standpoint individually, uh, tell me kind of how you ended up back home. How did you end up back here at LSU? So basically, um, when I put my uh, name in a uh, transfer portal, LSU was the first school to call me and offer me a scholarship. Um, it was Coach, uh, Coach Sloan and Coach Cooks. It was the first school off me a scholarship. They got me up here on a visit. And just seeing my family smile, you know, um, when I had my whole family out here, my mom, my dad, grandma, grandpa, sister, everybody was out here. And just seeing them smiling, you know, being able to see them, being able for them to come 45 minutes away every weekend is just, you know, something. So I just made that move. Yeah. Um, how about the recruiting part of it? When they were recruiting you out of the portal, um, how did they – sell to you how they were going to use you. Your versatility seems to be one of your, your biggest mm -hmm. tools, one of your biggest assets. For sure. Um, Coach Cooks, he kept harping on me about moving me around and just 
showing the player that I really am. You know, at um, no disrespect to the University of Arkansas, but um, I wasn't used in the right way. Yeah, I wasn't used in the right scheme. But now it's I'm used perfect, and it it's just been going great for me. Been making plays all over the field. Um, Matt House, defensive coordinator. What has what type of impact has he made on you here early on? What have you heard from him? What have you seen from his scheme? A uh, great impact. That's my guy. You know, um, I have had some family issues go on, and he's just been there for me and uh, understands everything. You know, um, he looks at, he he gets on me about being more vocal. You know, um, so that's what something I'm going to work on this off season. Yeah. But his scheme is great, and uh, I feel like we're going to make a whole bunch of plays just because we're going to play hard for him. That's the type of coach he is. Makai Gardner came and sat in that chair last week. He was talking about the mentality that you guys are building on that defensive side of the ball. What are your thoughts after coming out of spring, seeing that secondary and seeing some of the guys that are in competition? Uh, my thoughts are great. You know, our mentality is just to hunt every play. I'm pretty sure Makai, you know, uh, spoke on that, you know, tackle. That's yeah. the biggest, yeah. biggest harp that Coach House has, tackle, tackle, tackle. So for, for our secondary, we need to bring that swagger back and just hunt every yeah. play. Um, gee, we keep hearing about Robert Steeples, Coach mm -hmm. Steeples. What, 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 what is it about him that is making such an impact on you guys? You know, he brings energy. He's not one of the guys that's going to have – he's going to have a different energy a, a certain type of day. So um, that's what's so good about him, and he relates to us. You know, um, he was a high school teacher and stuff like that, so he knows how we are and knows what goes on in our life. Um. What about Tyron Matthew going to the Saints, bro? <laughs> That's hard. He, um, <laughs> he, he he texted me the other day. And really? It's it just like, you know, just seeing him come back home and be a neighborhood hero, that's awesome. Um, What was that like, having him come and speak to the program? You know, that was great for us, you know, just seeing, hearing his story and stuff like that. And it motivated a lot of us. It motivated me probably the most out of everybody because, you know, I always looked up to him. You know, we similar in size and stuff like that, but it motivated us for sure. Um, New Orleans, he's very New Orleans. He feels New Orleans. He is uh, He is New Orleans. Um, you have that draw to you. What is it like being back home and being around family? What, is, what does family, community, and the city of New Orleans mean to you? You know, it, it just motivates me even more just to, you know, play better. Like, you know, I'm playing for the state of Louisiana. I'm playing for the city of New Orleans, you know. And New Orleans is playing – you know, doing something with your life is a big deal. So I, I'm trying to take it to the next yeah. level with that. Absolutely. How much does it mean for, you mentioned like you're from New Orleans, and I feel like a lot of the people that Brian Kelly brought from the Port are all Louisiana guys. Mm -hmm. Do you kind of feel that in the locker room that this is, you know, you feel like you maybe not have known everybody, but y'all are all kind of from the Louisiana collective. Does that kind most, of feel that way through the locker room? Most definitely. You know, uh, all Louisiana guys relate in a certain way, you know, different mindsets and stuff like that. But um. I feel like we definitely connected within the locker room. Um, what's the experience of NIL been like for you? I mean, you're you're kind of an experienced guy. You've seen college football when it was – you guys were, were, were strictly not allowed to touch anything that was advantage for you. Now you're encouraged to go out there and, and, and find money for things that you can endorse. What's this experience been like for you? You know, it's been great. Shout out to um, Gordon. You know, man. Gordon, get it done. Get it done. Absolutely. You know, got my <laughs> shirt on right now. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, it's been great. You know, I'm uh, – I'm probably going to sign with somebody really soon, so um, we, we definitely are making that happen. Um, Gordon has been great for NIL, especially for a lot of you guys who are uh, on the roster. What did it mean in recruiting for you? Um, it didn't mean nothing to me in recruiting. Yeah. You know, all sorts of schools was talking about NIL stuff. Really? Were they really? Yes, sir. Uh, what was your portal experience like? What was that What was that experience like going into the portal? Um, You know, uh, hella offers, you know, um, but it came down to LSU, USC, and Texas. Why? What, what was it about? Was it just the relationships with the coaches? Yes. Um, Texas DB coach actually coached my dad in high school. Wow. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of you know. Wow, that was a big. That's a big win for Brian <laughs> Kelly. Um, what, what about Coach Kelly? What, what, what about him has stood out? You know, um, he's just a down to earth guy. You know, um, he doesn't really talk a lot sometimes, but uh. He, he's I like him a lot. You yeah. know, he, he gets his point across, and he gets what he wants done. And I feel like as a coach, in order to be a good team, your team has to respect you. So I feel like he's doing a good job with that. What's your emphasis on improving this offseason? What are you looking to work on? Um, Just get, improving my game mentally, you know, um, expecting the play to come, you know, stuff like that, and also get stronger. 
Big Kobe Bryant fan, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. How, sure. how, how does that go into uh, the, the Mamba mentality? Do, do you buy into that? I mean, is you you trying to create that? Um, I wouldn't say I'm trying to create that. I'm just trying to, you know, follow my own path and create my own mentality. You know what I'm saying? So when my time is done, uh, uh, other people look up to me and want to have my mentality that I had approaching the game. Anybody standing out to you after the first 15 practices in spring? I mean, guys, new team, new teammates for you, whether it be on the defensive side of the ball or even on the offensive side of the ball. A- anybody that you say, you know what, come fall, this cat's gonna be tough to gonna be tough to stop. A defensive guy would have to be Makai Wingle. That's one guy that y'all y'all gotta keep your eyes on for sure. His his name's always popping up within the room when we're in our defensive meetings. Um, and of course, you know the whole secondary guys like Makai. Joe Fouché and uh, uh, Jay Ward and Matt. He's Matt's made a big improvement on, and also Sage Ryan. Who'd you say, Matt? Mm-hmm. Who's uh, Matt Langwa? Mm-hmm. Dude, he uh, man, because he, he was getting um, he was getting criticized a little bit for his spring game. Or, you know, I mean, people were kind of running him over. But I don't think people realize how much weight he's put on since recruiting. Right. You know, to get to where he is now. Talk a little bit about him. Right. You know, um, Matt. He he's coming a long way. You know. He, caused like three turnovers in the last two practices, you know what I'm saying? And the spring game, we only ran one coverage. So it, it you really can't really tell what, what we're doing. Yeah. So, you know, it, I feel like that didn't mean anything. How many picks did you have in spring, bro? It felt like every day you were getting a pick. Mm. <laughs> um, I think like six or seven yeah. within. But I had like five in like the first four four practices. Yeah. I mean, they kind of they, they got you in the right spot, right? Yes. I mean – um, it's gonna be fun to watch, man. It's gonna be fun to watch. Hell of fun to watch. Uh, Trust over me. The next couple of uh, how much does it months. feel like you've been freed up playing for LSU as opposed to you said like you feel like you're in the wrong spot? What's kind of changed whenever you got to LSU in the defensive scheme in your mind? I'm just able to like be versatile, you know. Be, I'm around the ball a lot more, um, in the pass game a lot more, and it's just like it's better for me. You know what I'm saying? I don't. It's not. I don't have as much as of a responsibility, and that's the best part about my game. You get to play a little bit like the Badger. Exactly. Kind of like, around, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like, you know Coach House comes from the Chiefs. Yeah. And um, when uh, Tyron came down, we had talked about that. That was, uh, yeah, man, it makes a lot of sense in, in that position. Um, Joe Fusha is mm-hmm. is a guy also. You, you're his teammate transferring down from Arkansas. What's Y'all got to be excited about this together, right? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, he's, been, he's been my roommate for the past three years. Um, and we talked about it as soon as we put our names in the portal, you know, um, we talked about going back home and, uh, we just made it happen. You know, he did it before me. I wasn't quite just ready yet, but, um, yeah, we made that happen. Greg, it's great to meet you, man. Yes, sir. Um, I appreciate y'all having me. Yeah, man. Uh, what, what has been the the strength staff like here at LSU? I don't know. You didn't know Moffitt, um, Mm -hmm. but he was a guy that was, was here forever. What has, what have you made from, from coach Flint? Those guys are amazing, you know, um, they help me a lot. You know, I get my body, I take care of my body a whole lot. And um, before every practice, I get my body rolled. They make sure I'm good no matter what. And um, Coach Flint, he creating a standard, you know what I'm saying? Um, everything's like scientific data, you know, so we always track everything. And I like that a lot. You know, we didn't have that at Arkansas, so um, he, I feel like he's doing great. I don't, I'm not trying to get you in any trouble. You don't have to give me a name. Nuss Meyer just left, and it seems like it's great competition at that quarterback spot. What did you make of that quarterback competition over the last couple of weeks? Um, most definitely, uh, all three of the guys are actually doing well. You know, um, one day Miles will have a sixty yard, three sixty yard touchdowns. The next day, Jaden Daniels is going to run for four touchdowns. And another day, Nuss would do the same thing Miles is doing. So you know what I'm saying? It's a, it's a great competition. I can't wait to see who we have back there. Have a great off season, bro. You know that. Open invitation here anytime you want to come use the platform and get your message out. It's great to talk to you. Great to meet you. Welcome home. Yes, sir. Appreciate you for having me. Uh, Greg Brooks, LSU defensive back, back at LSU, transferring in from Arkansas. We will be back this afternoon with you here on the Jordy Collada Show. Damone Clark's going to stop in, and we'll do some. Uh, we will do a sit down with Damone, who just heard his name called over the last. Uh, in in the uh, over the last NFL draft, a couple of days for the Dallas Cowboys. We will talk to him coming up. Remember, we're daily brought to you by Johnson and Spillers. Enjoy your uh, Monday. Mikey Matuk will be back with you at 11 a.m. Uh, for Greg Brooks, for Garrett Nussmeyer, for Lizzie, for Stewie, for the Carpool Queen. Everybody here at the Jordy Collada Show will be back with you at uh, one o'clock. And for Mike Up, we have Kay Doty and Greg Jubair coming in studio after a little take the series from Georgia. So those were two obviously 
big time performances from those guys they'll be in studio as well and we'll talk to jay johnson greg brooks have a great day bro great to see you man there he is greg brooks defensive back from lsu checking in we're checking out we'll be back with you this afternoon here in the jordy colada show